Okay, good morning, guys. Can you see the screen? Yes, Doc. Good morning, Doc. All right. Uh, uh, remember, for your exam next week, uh, I'm not including the neuro exam of the unconscious patient anymore, okay? So, you remember, we were not able to discuss the neuro exam and brain death evaluation of an unconscious patient or comatose patient. So, I'm not including that anymore. And then, for the neuroinflammatory disorders, you only need to study multiple sclerosis, which is very simple. Uh, and then, I'm also removing the neuromuscular junction disorders for today, supposedly, because a stroke is such a broad uh, topic that I don't think uh, we can discuss it in only, only 30 minutes. All right, so let's start with dementia. And by the way, in this PowerPoint, I'm using the same PowerPoint, but do not study the amnestic disorders anymore, okay? Just the dementia, all right? Okay, and of course, when you say dementia, okay, a lot of times, you know, it is generalized, meaning it doesn't choose a specific lobe of the brain or a specific hemisphere. It's generalized, meaning it affects the entire brain. All right, and uh, usually there is progressive impairment in the content of consciousness, not the level of consciousness. Okay? I hope you guys understand that. Because when you say level of consciousness, you mean, you know, you are progressing from being fully alert and awake, okay, all the way to uh, being uh, drowsy or sleepy, and then obtunded, okay, and then, of course, it's super gross, and then eventually comatose. Uh, no, the level of consciousness should not be impaired. A patient with dementia, even if it's so severe, right, uh, you know, the patient is awake and alert. But the problem is the content of consciousness, not the level of consciousness. Please take note of that, okay? Remember, the questions in the exam uh, are going to be obtained from what we discuss. All right? So uh, please listen. All right? And, um, you know, again, the confusional states, amnestic disorders, those involve the level of consciousness, so we're not, that's not included in dementia, all right? So now, however, having said that, it doesn't mean that once we become older, then we're going to develop dementia. No, that's not a uh, an accompaniment of advanced age, right? Even though we become older, okay, it doesn't mean we're going to have dementia. But some people are more predisposed to developing dementia, all right? Okay, now, uh, a lot of times when older people or the, their families, okay, uh, when the patient becomes older and then become a little forgetful, okay, oh, I don't remember where I put my uh, glasses. Oh, I don't remember uh, those in you know, the birthday of our so cousin. Not, That's not all right. Now, being forgetful does not necessarily mean dementia, okay? Sometimes what they have is just a what we call MCI or mild cognitive impairment, okay? All right, and, you know, this is just a mild condition. And uh, a lot of times, this is just part of getting older, right? We forget a certain, you know, certain things, but it doesn't necessarily mean we have dementia. All right, the bottom line is, when you say dementia, you have to make sure that the day-to-day -day living or the activities of daily living of the patient is already affected. And the lifestyle of the patient is affected. Okay, it's not just memory, all right? A lot of times, we associate dementia with memory loss, but it's not just, um, you know, memory loss. The behavior of the patient becomes affected, the personality changes, all right? So the day-to-day -day living is already impaired, okay? But then again, like I said, there's a form of, uh, you know, memory problem, which is called MCI or mild cognitive impairment, where it's the patient's day-to-day -day living is not really affected, right? You know, maybe there's a little bit of forgetfulness, but the patient can still function in society. All right? Okay. Um, now, these are some of the things that occur as we become older, right? There will be some changes in the motor system, some changes in the sensory system, the reflexes, the eyes, okay? For example, uh, as we become older, the, the pupils will be a little bit small and sluggishly reactive, but stabilization, this is how you're going to differentiate, okay, delirium from dementia. All right, or acute confusional state from dementia. Okay? Again, the level of consciousness should be not should not be impaired in dementia. Even if you have Alzheimer's, you are fully alert, you are fully awake, right? Unless it is really, really, really advanced stage of dementia where the patient becomes bedridden, okay, then of course the level of consciousness may be affected, right? Because all the patient does is lay down in bed because he cannot function anymore. 
it doesn't have the facility to do anything, right? So he cannot even stand up. He cannot even uh, walk. So, you know, the level of consciousness may be affected. In delirium or a confusional state, definitely the level of consciousness is the one because he cannot function anymore. And again, in dementia, it have the facility to do anything. Okay? Now, in terms of course, of course, acute confusional state is acute, right? Delirium is acute, right? So, uh, you know, the... the, um, the progression is acute. The onset is acute. It may become subacute, but it's not chronic. It's not long-standing. Okay, and it can be fluctuating depending on the abnormality. For example, hyponatremia. Okay, hyponatremia may cause a patient to become confused. So the patient's mental status may be fluctuating. Hepatic encephalopathy. Right, it's a metabolic problem. So it's a fluctuating um, state. Whereas with dementia, it is chronic and steadily progressive. It will keep getting worse and worse and worse and worse until the last day of the patient on earth. Okay. Now, with delirium, okay, usually there is autonomic hyperactivity. Okay, the blood pressure goes up, the uh, the patient becomes tachycardic, okay, there might be some temperature changes. All right, the patient becomes anxious, you know, when you have delirium. But in dementia, again, that's not present, right? The patient is existing normally. I mean, existing in the sense that the patient is awake, alert, okay, but it, the patient doesn't necessarily have tachycardia, hypertension, all right, no changes in the um, vital signs, etc., etc. okay? And then prognosis, of course, usually reversible, okay? When you have delirium, usually it is reversible, okay, because it really depends on the metabolic problem. For example, again, hyponatremia, then correct the hyponatremia. You just have to correct it slowly, otherwise the patient will develop uh, central pontin myelinolysis. Okay? So it is usually reversible depending on the metabolic problem or, you know, sepsis or whatever, okay, that is causing the delirium. But with dementia, it is irreversible usually, okay? Now, usually, which means that there are types of dementia that are reversible. And what types of dementia are reversible? Do you remember? Anyone? Can you give me a type of dementia that's reversible? NPH, right? Normal pressure arteriocephalus. All you need to do is place a ventricular peritoneal shunt, okay, and the, rever the dementia will be reversed. Another type of dementia that can be reversed is neurosyphilis, right? Neurosyphilis can cause dementia, but when you treat it with intramuscular benzatine penicillin, then the dementia may improve. Of course, may. We're saying may. Okay, uh, another type of dementia that can be reversed is vitamin B12 deficiency, right? Because all you need to do is replenish the deficient vitamin B12 and the dementia will soon improve. All right, so there are certain types of dementia that are reversible. But if we're talking about Alzheimer's, we're talking about frontotemporal dementia, those are irreversible. Okay, all right. So the very first step, okay, when you encounter a patient, please listen to me, okay, instead of reading and reading and reading, okay, listen, all right? The very first step, if you see a patient that is referred to you because of uh, dementia, quote, unquote, okay, the very first step is to determine the nature of the problem, which means is this patient having a problem with the level of consciousness or is it the content of consciousness? Okay, see, we're going back to the uh, differentiation between delirium and dementia, okay? So if a patient's memory loss, is this memory loss, memory loss secondary to uh, you know, delirium or is it secondary to dementia? So that's the very first thing you need to know if you get a patient that was referred to you because of cognitive impairment. Okay? Identify the nature of the problem. Is it the level of consciousness or is it the content of the consciousness? Okay? And then everything will follow. All right. Eventually, you will be able to identify the cause and see if we can reverse the problem. Okay. All right. Of course, history is very important. Okay, again, you need to establish that the uh, the um, the problem has affected the day-to-day -day living of the patient. Okay, you need to do physical examination because certain things can give you clues. You know, certain things on the general physical examination. For example, um, you know, uh, in neurosyphilis, for example, there is Argyle Robertson pupil, right? They are small, irregular pupils that. Um, accommodate but do not react to light. Okay, so if you see that, then that gives you a clue that, aha, uh -huh, this dementia is probably secondary to neurosyphilis. So it will help you guide 
your management for the patient. And all the patient needs to have is the penicillin and everything will be better. Okay. All right. And then, of course, the mental status exam. The mental status exam of the neuro exam is very important because we're dealing with cognition here, right? So it's very important. Okay. You need to know the level of the consciousness of the patient, the language and speech, the mood and affect and behavior, the memory. And then the this is what I'm talking about, right? The cortical sensory integration or the integrative sensory function. Astereognosis, agraphistitia, two-point discrimination, extinction, okay, neglect, right? Remember, this may be sensory, but what you're testing here is mental status exam. Please take note of that, okay? And you are actually specifically testing the integration of the sensation in the brain or sensory integration in the brain, in the cortex. All right, and then of course, integrative motor function like apraxia. When you say apraxia, that means loss of the ability to perform a learned skill. For example, combing your hair, brushing your teeth, that's something that we have learned uh, since childhood, right? We should know how to do that. But in patients with dementia, of course, it may be affected, and that's what's called apraxia. Okay, for example, gait apraxia in NPH, normal pressure decephalus. The patient with NPH doesn't know how to walk anymore. So they tend to have a what we call magnetic gait, right? They cannot lift their uh, foot up or feet up, okay? They, they try to walk, but they look like they don't know how to walk, okay? And that's, that's what we call a gait apraxia. All right. And um, of course, eventually you will have to do a neurological examination, right? To determine, okay, what, you know, can, uh, to determine if you can find any clues as to the cause of the dementia of the patient, all right? Okay, you need to do some tests, right? It's standard that you have to do a uh, CBC and check for the hematocrit, right? The MCV, all right, why? Because uh, vitamin B12 deficiency can cause megaloblastic anemia, right? And therefore, the MCV will be increased, okay? And then the hematocrit will be less, okay? The, the cells, the red blood cells are actually bigger than normal. Okay, and that's what you call megaloblastic, right? Or macrocytic anemia, all right? And that you can find in B12 deficiency. Of course, thyroid, you need to check the thyroid because hypothyroidism can cause dementia and it is reversible, okay? Whereas, okay, whereas hyperthyroidism can cause delirium, okay? Please take note of that, okay? Hyperthyroidism, when you have increased thyroid hormones, right? You may have uh, thyroid toxicosis, right? So you may become uh, uh, delirious, et cetera, et cetera, okay? The thyroid crisis, then that is delirium. Whereas in dementia, it is actually the hypothyroidism, all right? Now, you need to check the liver function. Why? Because Wilson's disease, right? If you recall, Wilson's disease can cause uh, chorea, Okay, and dementia as well as liver failure, right? Okay, all right. Remember, you need to check the seroloplasmin and copper level, right? Because that's Wilson's, all right? For neurosyphilis, you need to check for the FPA and, or the MHATP, right? Okay, and then, of course, uh, when you examine the CSF, right? CSF BDRL will identify neurosyphilis, all right? If you check the cytology of the CSF, if you see cells, then maybe there is metastatic uh, tumor in the brain, right? Okay, and then prion, remember, the uh, infectious protein, all right, can identify the Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, all right? Alzheimer's, okay, certain proteins can be identified, all right? HIV-associated dementia, you can identify uh, HIV mRNA, okay? And then, of course, imaging, that's something that's very important, okay? You may identify brain tumor, chronic subdural hematoma, vascular dementia, normal pressure decephalus, Alzheimer's, frontotemporal, and of course, CJD, Kreutzfeldt-Jakob. Okay, PET scan will help identify Alzheimer's disease. EEG can help identify Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease, right? There will be uh, um, lateralizing, okay, epileptiform discharges, kind of similar to herpes simplex virus encephalitis, right? And then of course, dialysis dementia, Okay, will help in uh, if we are go. I mean, will be identified if we do an EEG. Okay, so those are the tests that you need to order if you're seeing a patient and you're suspecting the patient has uh, dementia. All right. Okay, and uh, again, these are some of the causes 
which we have discussed already, right? Okay, now, when you, uh, in the history, you need to identify family history because Huntington's disease, okay, can cause dementia in Korea, right? Wilson's disease, same thing, dementia in Korea, all right? And then, uh, you know, unprotected sexual intercourse, no matter how long ago it was, and that can cause, uh, you know, um, neurosyphilis or HIV-associated dementia, history of IV drug abuse, maybe the patient has HIV-associated dementia, all right, et cetera, et cetera. So headache, okay, maybe the patient has a brain tumor or subdural hematoma. Remember, subdural hematoma will start as acute, but then eventually it can become chronic, right? Okay. Vital signs, check the vital signs. If the patient has hypothermia, then maybe hypothyroidism. If the patient has hypertension, then maybe it's vascular dementia. If the patient has hypotension, then again, hypothyroidism. Bradycardia, hypothyroidism. Okay? Common sense, right? Okay. And then if you do a physical examination, of course, meningeal signs, Brzezinski sign, Kernig sign, maybe the patient has chronic meningitis, which may present as dementia, right? Because it's chronic already. John this again, Wilson's disease with liver uh, degeneration. Kaiser Fleischer ring in Wilson's disease, if you recall, right? This is the brownish discoloration of the periphery of the cornea because of copper deposition, okay? Mental status exam, very prominent, prominent memory loss, Alzheimer's, okay? If the patient has aphasia, then it could be frontotemporal dementia, okay? But it could also be secondary to vascular dementia because of multiple strokes in the past. Hallucinations, do we body dementia, remember? Vivid visual hallucinations. And then if you examine the cranial nerves, if you see papillae edema, then maybe there's a space occupying lesion, brain tumor, subdural hematoma. Argyle Robertson pupils, neurosyphilis. Ophthalmoplegia, ESP, right? Progressive supranuclear palsy. Pseudobulbar palsy, okay, vascular dementia and progressive supranuclear palsy, right? And, and so forth and so on, okay? So in other words, you need to do a complete physical examination and neurological examination on the patient, okay? And, you know, uh, as you know, some of the dementias actually are related to uh, abnormal proteins, right? Remember with Alzheimer's, you will find the beta amyloid, the tau protein, okay? And then the frontotemporal dementia, the TDP43, Okay, et cetera, et cetera. Parkinson's is a form of dementia also. Besides being a movement disorder, it can cause uh, um, dementia also. And this is related to the alpha synocline. Okay, and then Lewy body dementia, okay, is also related to alpha synocline. That's why they have Parkinsonism and then they have vivid hallucinations, right? And the uh, fluctuating mental status, all right? The Huntington gene, morning, which is present in Huntington's screen. disease. And then, of course, the prion protein, which you will identify in Creutzfeldt Jakob disease. Uh, uh, remember, okay. for exam next week. Uh, now, this is actually what you're going to see if you're going to study histologically uh, the brain of a patient with um, Alzheimer's. Okay, you will see the neuritic plaques. Okay, and you will see the neurofibrillary tangles. Okay. Neurofibrillary tangles are these dark, pigmented uh, structures, okay? And then the neuritic plaques is this star-shaped uh, abnormal neurons. Okay? And this is actually what you're going to see. This is pathognomonic of um, Alzheimer's disease, okay? Uh, see, look at this neuritic plaque. Okay, neuritic plaques, multiple of them. All right, neuritic plaques. Okay. okay. And even the in the small blood vessels of the brain, you will see actually uh, senile plaques next to it. Okay. And you will see uh, abnormal staining of the blood vessels. And this is what we call amyloid angiopathy because of the position of beta amyloid. All right, so these are some of the genes implicated in a uh, hereditary form of Alzheimer's, okay? I'm not uh, going to ask you that anymore, okay? Now, 
when you do an MRI on a patient with, remember, CT scan is probably useless, right? Because CT scan is important only if you are studying the bones or blood, right? But otherwise, if you want to look at the brain itself, the brain parenchyma, the soft tissues, then MRI is much better, okay? If you are going to do an MRI, please take note. If you're going to do an MRI on a patient with Alzheimer's, you will notice that the dementia, okay, is kind of more, more um, how do you say it? More pronounced posteriorly, okay? See, look at the sulci here in the posterior aspect. Right? They are wider compared to the sulci in the anterior. Okay, same thing here. Look at this tulkus. It's very big already. You can insert two fingers already, right? Okay, and here, it's obvious. If you're going to compare the anterior with the posterior, you can see that the uh, sulci and fissures uh, here I'm not are much wider the compared the to the anterior aspect. Same thing here, especially here, right? Look anymore, at the okay? sulci. So and the gyro and the um, fissures the are much wider compared to the anterior aspect, which means that with Alzheimer's, okay, that's one thing you will notice. If you're going to do a brain scan, especially MRI, you will notice that there is preferential atrophy of the posterior part rather than the anterior. Okay, please take note of that. Mainly posterior. Okay, see, look at this. Look at this freshly harvested uh, MRI of a patient with Alzheimer's. Okay, the gyri here are too wide na. I mean, sorry, the sulci and fissures are too wide compared to the uh, anterior aspect. Plus, look at the gyri here. These are smaller compared to the gyri in the anterior, right? They are still thick. Right? I hope you can see that, right? Same thing here. The anterior aspect compared to the posterior, right? The gyri here are much uh, smaller compared to the gyri here. Same thing here. So posterior, posterior, posterior. Now, this is a PET scan, see? There is actually a hypometabolism in the posterior aspect compared to the anterior. Okay? All right. Uh, well, generally, this is actually what you're going to see, right? I mean, it's obvious, right? There will be, uh, in, in, in uh, patients with dementia, okay, there will be shrinking of the brain. Therefore, if you're going to compare this normal... Uh, normal brain, meaning there's no atrophy, whereas this one, there is, this is shrunken already. And the gyri are smaller and the fissures are wider. Okay, same thing here, cross-section. Because of the shrinking of the brain, then there will be less parenchyma with bigger or enlargement of the ventricle. Okay. Same thing here, look at the posterior aspect, wider compared to the anterior. Of course, we're not saying that the anterior is not involved. Of course, the anterior is also involved. It's just that there's preferential atrophy of the posterior aspect. Okay? Now, there's really no cure for dementia, right? Remember, that's why it's irreversible. All right? There's nothing much that you can do. You're, now, there are certain medications that are prescribed. Because your only goal is to slow down its progression. You're not, uh, um, you don't have the ambition to cure it, right? But you want to prescribe, you want your doctor to prescribe something for your mom, for your dad, for your grandpa, grandma, uncle, and whatever, because you want to slow down the progression of the disease so that you can still spend time, quality time with your loved ones, okay? So these are the medications that are prescribed, okay? The memantine, which is considered probably to be the most effective. All right, and then, of course, the nepezil, rivastigmine, galantamine. Sometimes we combine them, the memantine plus the donepezil. All right, and again, the goal is not to reverse the problem, not to make everything back to normal, no. The only goal is to slow down the progression of the disease so you can still spend uh, quality time with your loved ones, okay? But remember, a lot of these have side effects, and the most common is gastrointestinal. Nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, okay, abdominal cramping, etc., etc. Okay, next, frontotemporal dementia. Frontotemporal dementia. During our time, we used to call this Pick's disease. Now, nobody wants to use Pick's disease. So let's stick with FTD or frontotemporal dementia. Now, with frontotemporal dementia, okay, you will see tau proteins, the abnormal proteins, right? These are the inclusion bodies. All right? <clears throat> 
Now, the tau protein, uh, the, the molecular structure is like this, all right? Which you will see also in Alzheimer's, okay? We're not saying that this is exclusively for frontotemporal dementia, but, okay, even Alzheimer's can have abnormal tau proteins, also, right? Inclusion bodies, all right? Now, how will you differentiate in terms of presentation? Okay, in, in frontotemporal dementia, with Alzheimer's disease, sorry, in Alzheimer's disease, the most prominent problem is memory, right? Your grandpa doesn't re remember you anymore, doesn't know your name, doesn't recall you being the favorite grandson or granddaughter, whatever. So you'll just cry and cry and cry because you love your grandpa so much, right? Okay, now, with frontotemporal dementia, it's not so much on the memory, okay? But it's mainly behavior and speech and language, okay? Please take note of that. With frontotemporal dementia, it's not so much on the memory, but it's mainly on the behavior and personality and the speech and language of the patient. Okay? All right. And then at the same time, this is the opposite. Okay, remember in, in Alzheimer's, we say it's prefer there's preferential atrophy of the posterior, but this time it's preferential atrophy of the anterior okay that's why you call it frontotemporal dementia so it's mainly the anterior aspect the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe okay look at the temporal lobe here see it's all shrunken with a big dark space meaning that's the subarachnoid space already right as opposed to the posterior okay here the frontal lobe see you have the uh, widening of the sulci or the fissures okay and then here, it's mainly the anterior as opposed to the posterior. Same thing here. The anterior is preferentially involved compared to the posterior. Okay, even in the PET scan, you can see uh, that there is uh, there seems to be more involvement of the anterior rather than the posterior. Okay, again, that's the opposite of all. Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's preferential atrophy of the posterior, whereas frontotemporal preferential atrophy of the anterior. Another difference is Alzheimer's is largely memory or cognitive. Okay, you know, of course, that includes personality, behavior, you know, everything also, but pre uh, uh, largely it's cognitive, whereas in frontotemporal dementia, okay, it's largely behavioral, personality, and speech and language. Now, why speech and language? Well, we just said that the uh, there's preferential atrophy of the frontotemporal, right? And what speech center do you find in the frontal lobe? Oh. Brocus area. Brocus area. Exactly. And what speech center do you find in the temporal lobe? Temporal. Wernicke. Wernicke's. Wernicke. Oh, See, that's why that's why you call it frontotemporal dementia. So it it preferentially involves the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe, and that's where you're going to find the speech centers. That's why speech, okay, problem is uh, more pronounced here compared to Alzheimer's. Okay, and the behavioral and the um, uh, personality, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because of the limbic system, right? because of the mesial temporal lobe, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? All right. Now, we're not saying that their memory is perfect. No. They also have cognitive problems. It's just that the more pronounced uh, abnormality is the behavior, the personality, and the speech and language. Okay? They may have problem with speech. Okay? They may, you may see a little bit of aphasia there, even though there's really no stroke. Right? And that's because there is involvement of the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. Okay? Now, of course, there is also a genetic component there, right? You may see tau proteins, inclusion bodies, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to ask you this specific genetic uh, uh, problems here, okay? Um, treatment, again, there's really not much that you can do because this is irreversible. There is no cure, all right? Now, sometimes doctors prescribe, uh, you know, the medicines that they give for Alzheimer's, the memantine. Remember the anticholinesterase drugs, okay? Uh, but really, they have not been shown to be effective. And there's really, again, not much that you can do, unfortunately. Okay, now, of course, because it involves behavior, 
and sometimes they prescribe antidepressants, you know, trazodone, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, the results are variable. Sometimes they help, sometimes they don't. Okay? Next, corticobasal degeneration or corticobasal ganglionic degeneration. All right? As the term implies, it means that it affects the cortex and the basal nuclei or basal ganglia. All right? Now, what will you see on the imaging? What you will see here is that there is asymmetry between the two hemispheres. Okay? Now, if you're going to compare the right with the left, there seems to be more atrophy on the right side compared to the left. Of course, again, both sides are atrophic, right? But uh, it seems to be asymmetric. See, this is the gross uh, inspection. See, there is definite, um, and the more, there's more atrophy here on the right cerebral hemisphere compared to the other side, okay? So that's why these people will present with alien hand syndrome. Do you know the meaning of alien hand syndrome? It means that whichever side is affected, like here, the right hemisphere is more atrophic then the left hand or left arm of the patient will exhibit the alien hand syndrome, meaning you know, it, uh, the left hand or arm of the patient seems to be wandering or moving uh, uh, involuntarily. All right? That's why if you sit next to someone, then you start touching that person and that person will slap you all right? or will slap your grandpa or whatever. Okay? And that's what you call limb apraxia. Okay? Limb apraxia meaning you know, uh, ideally when you just sit down, then you don't move your arm, right? Especially when you are sitting next to someone, right? But with limb apraxia, you know, you tend to lose the learned skill of, uh, you know, just being quiet there. So the arm or the hand that is affected will start moving or seems to be moving on its own. All right? And that's what you call alien hand syndrome, okay? And that's because there's involvement of the basal ganglia. And as you know, basal ganglia, okay, modulates uh, voluntary movement. So if you destroy the basal ganglia, then it will start, you will start manifesting abnormal movements, okay, like tremors, okay, et cetera, et cetera. So there seems to be clumsiness in the arm, okay? All right. So again, what do you need to remember with corticobasal degeneration? Okay, involvement of the cortex and the basal ganglia or nuclei, right? And there's asymmetry. One hemisphere seems to be more in atrophic compared to the other side, and there is alien hand syndrome or limb apraxia, or they may have, might have tremors, clumsiness, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, all right. Of course, the same, irreversible, no treatment. Next, PSP, all right, progressive supranuclear palsy. All right, with progressive supranuclear palsy, all right, with these patients, actually, there seems to be, again, um, you know, abnormality or, or um, degeneration of the cortex, the gray matter, the basal ganglia, and even the brainstem. So that these patients, okay, remember with, with Parkinson's, they tend to be in a flexed position, right? They, stoop, they have a stoop posture. But this is the exact opposite. They are hyperextended, okay? The body is either straight or even all the way extended to the back, okay? As opposed to... Uh, Parkinson's, and then they have a problem with vertical eye movements. Okay, if you ask the patient, all right, Mr. David, look at the pen light, and then you bring it up, then they cannot move their eyeballs up and down. Okay, so vertical eye movement, but side to side, they can do it without any problem. And then they have significant dysphagia and speech difficulty. Okay, why? Because the brain stem is atrophic. All right. Of course, that means you know there will be problem with the tongue movements. There will be problem with uh, um, esophagus. There will be problems with the muscles of the larynx and pharynx, the soft palate, etc., etc. Because the brainstem is involved. Okay. All right. See, look at this. Look at this elderly lady. Right. She's in a wheelchair. She cannot walk anymore, and yet her uh, body is hyperextended. Is looking up the ceiling, but her body is fixed like that. All right, just like this lady, her head seems to be tilted up, and then she cannot look up or look down. She's trying her best, but she cannot. Okay, and this guy, the eyes are fixed. Okay, up, and she he does seem to have ophthalmoplegia. Right, both eyes are uh, you know uh, misaligned, but he cannot look up or down. All right, and then the mouth is open because. They, you know, they just have the uh, the brainstem is involved. 
Okay, and again, uh, with this type of patient, you know, with this type of dementia, there is no cure. They will eventually die. Okay, and a lot of these people with dementia they die because of infection, aspiration, all right, being bedridden or wheelchair bound. They cannot do anything else. And then they have UTI, right? They have aspiration pneumonia. These are the usual causes of death of, of patients with dementia, especially when they become bedbound or bedridden. Okay. Lewy body disease or Lewy body dementia. Lewy body dementia, it also has it's it also has or related to the alpha synuclein protein, just like Parkinson's, right? So it is considered a synuclinopathy. Same thing with Parkinson's. And therefore, both of them will present with Parkinsonism. All right. Remember the triad of Lewy body dementia. What's the triad? Number one, Parkinsonism. Okay. Number two, fluctuating mental status. And number three, vivid visual hallucination. Okay. If you have this three, the triad of Lewy body disease, then you got the diagnosis. Okay. Again, it's more of a clinical diagnosis because you can only do brain, you know. Autopsy when the patient dies, right? You're not gonna you're not gonna subject your grandpa, your beloved grandpa, to a brain biopsy just because you want to prove that this patient has Lewy body dementia. Of course, you can do that, but that's a little uh, uh, impractical, right? To undergo a brain biopsy or brain uh, yeah brain biopsy just because you want to prove, and yet there's no cure anyway, right? So it's impractical. So you can only make the official diagnosis when the patient dies already or when the patient is dead already, okay? So you will uh, see, okay, the um, alpha synuclein and the Lewy bodies, which are actually intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies. Look at this, all right? These are the inclusion bodies, meaning they are inside the cells, okay? And, uh, you know, again, what do you need to remember about Lewy body disease? The triad, okay, fluctuating mental status, Vivid visual hallucinations. When you say vivid, they can describe to you in detail. Oh, your grandpa will, will tell you, oh, there are children playing inside my room. I don't want to sleep there. They're too noisy. And then grandpa will even describe, there are three of them. One child is wearing red dress with a ribbon on the you know, neck. And then she's wearing an orange. You know, she, your grandpa is even described this in detail as if there were really people there, okay? Animals or whatever they are. It's a very vivid visual hallucination, okay? All right, and they also have Parkinsonism, meaning they have rigidity, bradykinesia, pill rolling tremor, shuffling gait, etc., etc. okay? Next, Huntington's disease. Huntington is autosomal dominant, so this is genetic, right? And they present with chorea, okay? Again, this is a triad. And what's a triad of Huntington's disease? Number one, dementia. Number two, chorea. And number three, psychiatric symptoms. Okay? Right. Remember, Huntington's will start appearing in the middle age, right? Like in the, you know, well, not necessarily middle age, but uh, by the time they reach middle age, usually it's full-blown already. And then they will die. Okay? But symptoms may occur as early as in their 20s or 30s. All right? Usually... Okay, at least from what I have seen, okay, I have seen several patients with Huntington's disease, okay, and you can see it in any country, anywhere, all right? These people will start with behavioral problems first. They will become depressed. They will start withdrawing themselves, isolating themselves. They are, they don't want to get out of the house, okay? They will start manifesting behavioral problems, okay? And then eventually, they will start manifesting Korea for movements. And as you know, Korea is these involuntary movements, okay, which are irregular. It can affect any part of the body, the head and neck, the tongue, okay, the eyes, blinking, okay, the fingers, the hands, the arms, etc. etc. So, and then eventually they will develop dementia. Okay. And this is actually the again, this is genetic or somal dominant. And the problem here is there is trinucleotide repeat. And the repeat uh, the trinucleotide that is repeated here is the CAG or the histidine. Uh, sorry, not histidine, but the, um, the glutamine. Okay, CAG. Look at look at this. All right. Normally, uh, this is a let's say let's say this is normal genetic code, right? TAT, which codes for histidine, and then TCA, which codes for serine, CAG, which codes for glutamine, and then GTA for valine, etc., etc. 
right? That's normal. Now, with Huntington's disease, there's a repeat of CAG. Okay, let's go down here. This is uh, Huntington's. CAT, same thing here. And then next is TCA, okay. And then CAG, all right, glutamine. But then, instead of GTA, there's a repeat of the CAG. There's, there's already one CAG here. And here comes another CAG, which codes for glutamine. And another CAG coding for glutamine. Now you have three glutamines in sequence. Glutamine, glutamine, glutamine. Whereas here, glutamine, valine, okay, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? Therefore, there is a trinucleotide repeat. Now, this will not manifest until it reaches 40 repeats. Okay, normally, it's not going to manifest, the patient's not going to manifest uh, symptoms of Huntington's until CAG is repeated 40 times. Okay, please take note of that. Now, again, they will present first with behavioral problems, depression, et cetera, et cetera, and then eventually career form movements and the dementia. That's a triad, okay? And a lot of these people, okay, they eventually die in middle age, 40s, 50s, and, uh, you know, uh, a lot of them actually commit suicide, okay, because that's a behavioral or psychiatric problem that they have, okay? They commit suicide. And then you will uh, eventually find out that they had a, their dad actually had the same problem before, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So again, there seems to be an overlap between all these uh, yeah. dementia disorders. Okay? All right. Now, there is what you call Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, which is related to a prion, infectious protein, right? Okay? What happens is that with TJD or Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, all right, there will be misfolding of the protein, okay? And these misfolded proteins will now aggregate, okay? From being unstable aggregates, they will become stable aggregates. And this can be passed on to a neighboring neuron, okay? And it will be incorporated into the genome of the next neuron, okay? Until, basically, it becomes a continuous uh, Activity, right? From neuron one, now it will be transferred to neuron two, it will be transferred to neuron three, neuron four, et cetera, et cetera. And what you are transmitting is not really a microorganism, but a prion, which is an abnormal protein. That's why this is an infectious disease, but it's not really a microorganism, but a prion that is transferred from one neuron to another. Okay, all right. And with CJD, if you recall, there's actually a triad again. If, what, if anyone who remembers the triad of, of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, okay, number one, okay, they actually have dementia, right? And the dementia that they have is characteristically rapidly progressive, okay? Remember, dementia is something that you get after 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, 20 years. There's no such thing as dementia occurring in one year, two years, three years. This is several years, decades, all right? But with Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease or CJD, the dementia is actually uh, rapidly progressive. In a matter of two months, three months, it's full-blown dementia already. The patient is bedridden, okay? All right, that's the characteristic dementia of CJD, rapidly progressive. All right, so you have a triad, rapidly progressive dementia. Next, they have myoclonus. All right, and as you recall from yesterday, when you have myoclonus, okay, this uh, is this can be epileptic or not, but these are abnormal jerking, rapid, okay, uh, uh, jerking of groups of muscles, usually in the upper part of the body, the head and neck, the shoulders, the chest, the arms, okay. Usually the legs are spared, so even if the patient is sitting down, the patient doesn't fall because. The lower part of the body is not affected, usually. I'm just saying usually, okay? The upper part. Okay, so that's two. Remember, you have triad. Rapidly progressive dementia, myoclonus, and then third is EEG complexes, which are periodic. What does that mean, EEG, uh, periodic EEG complexes? Right? When you do an EEG, they're periodic, right? Okay. Periodic complexes. It's like a, a complex that it recurs repeatedly. Okay, when you do an EEG. All right. And when the patient dies, okay, and you do an autopsy, you're going to see a lot of vacuoles or empty spaces. This actually will give you that spongy form appearance of the brain, just like in this 
see, look, it looks like a sponge. The brain will be reduced to, uh, you know, sponge-looking brain, all right? This is what you call spongiform encephalopathy. Okay, it looks like a sponge. And if you're going to do a histological evaluation of this or, a, or histopathological evaluation, you will see a lot of vacuolization, a lot of vacuole. Okay, all right, the triad again. What do you need to remember about uh, Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease? Number one, this uh, is a triad of rapidly progressive dementia. Number two, myoclonals. And number three, uh, periodic complexes on EEG, okay? And it is, again, rapidly developing. Why Why don't I forget this? I never. I will never forget this because I did see, uh, well, a total of uh, maybe two or three in my lifetime. But there's one particular. I was a new neurologist, okay? I did not know much yet. And when the patient was referred to me, another doctor, another neurologist for second opinion, okay, I did not make a diagnosis of um, Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease, okay? And I eventually referred the patient to a university hospital for them to study the case. And it turned out when the patient died, the final diagnosis was Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease, okay? And again, there's no cure anyway. It's just a rapid progression, okay? First, the patient will have <clears throat> maybe memory problem, and then eventually, you know, after two months or three months only, the patient will die because of, you know, uh, rapid progression. Okay, and remember the C the prion the infectious protein you can get that from surgical uh, tools, right? During surgery, the surgeon might transfer the infectious protein from one patient to another. Corneal transplants, human growth hormone uh, infusion, right? You know, in other words, things that are harvested from uh, another patient and then used by another patient. Okay, so be careful. Okay. All right, see, look at the vacuolization, all vacuoles, okay? Next is vascular dementia. Vascular dementia, okay, means that this is, or, or this used to be known as multi-infarct dementia, all right? Meaning that this is related to multiple strokes, all right? Which means that, okay, in vascular dementia, because of accumulation of uh, strokes, then eventually the patient will develop dementia. Okay, so when you do an MRI, you will see all these multiple, you know, uh, strokes, whether they are big or small. Basically, there seems to be a confluence or um, uh, the multiple infarcts actually uh, become confluent. And then eventually it will start affecting the uh, memory of the patient, okay, and even the behavior and personality. Okay, and again, it's related to multiple infarcts. Okay, so if you have a patient presenting with, you think the patient has Alzheimer's, and then the patient is old already, and then the patient has uh, multiple risk factors for stroke, diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, uh, heavy smoking, uh, high cholesterol, and then, you know, using drugs. Okay, if you see a patient presenting with dementia, and then the patient has multiple risk factors for stroke, think about vascular dementia, Okay. I'm just saying that there's a high likelihood that the dementia is not Alzheimer's, but vascular dementia, okay? All right. Um, so you need to, there's really not much that you can do for the uh, dementia part, but at least you can prevent a full-blown stroke that can kill the patient by controlling the risk factors. Take care of the diabetes, the hypertension, the high cholesterol, stop smoking, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and then of course, put this patient on Antiplatelets, right? The aspirin, clopidogrel, okay, and put them on cholesterol medicines, control the blood pressure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, see, look at these multiple infarcts. Okay, next, chronic subdural hematoma, right? Remember, like I told you, when you have head trauma in elderly patients, especially 50s, 60s, 70s, right? Uh, they may not feel anything, but then the blood may accumulate. Uh, but this is a lot of times patients survive or this may be compatible with life because this is unoxygenated blood because the lacerated blood vessels here are the bridging veins, not the middle meningeal artery. All right. Okay, everybody, please mute your microphone. Okay, all right. Um, now, of course, 
first it will be, be chronic uh, acute right but then as time goes on it may become chronic subdural hematoma especially if you don't uh, if you ignore it right so a lot of our older people uncle aunts grandpa grandma right they bump their head you know on the cabinet on the door etc etc and then they don't pay attention they think they just have a headache but the reality is the bridging veins have been lacerated therefore there's accumulation of blood Okay, like here, this is bilateral, even worse, right? So they may cause compression of the brain and therefore start causing problems, okay? So, okay, if the patient is symptomatic or there's rapid deterioration, then you need to refer them to the neurosurgeon so that they can remove the blood or the hematoma, okay? And the dementia may be reversed. Okay, and pH, normal pressure hydrocephalus, again, this is a triad, number one, Dementia, number two, gait apraxia or magnetic gait, and number three, urinary incontinence. Okay, now how does NPH form? What causes NPH? Of course, no one really knows the exact reason, but a lot of times these patients, uh, these patients actually have okay scarring, scar formation, especially here on top in the area of the area of the arachnoid villi or arachnoid granulations. And remember, these arachnoid villi or arachnoid granulations are the ones that drain the CSF okay, into the superior sagittal sinus so that it can be uh, brought back to the internal jugular vein and then eventually the right uh, side of the heart okay, to get oxygenated. Right? The problem is there seems to be scarring here. And usually the scarring is due to meningitis in the past or head trauma. All right? So, you know, if there's significant head trauma in the past or meningitis in the past, it will cause uh, scarring of the meninges and therefore it will affect the arachnoid granulations. So there will be accumulation of CSF. But the good thing here is that the pressure is normal. It's not really increased. Okay. All right. So it's, that's why it's called normal pressure decephalus. There is accumulation of CSF, but okay, it's not uh, causing... Uh, a significant problem because the pressure is normal still. All right? Now, this is a triad. Again, like I said, gait apraxia, magnetic gait, okay, dementia, and then urinary incontinence. So, okay, this is a communicating type of hydrocephalus or non-obstructive type of hydrocephalus. Okay? Well, sorry. Did I say, uh, well, non-communicating because... Ah, sorry, communicating, sorry. Communicating the type of hydrocephalus because the lateral ventricle, the third ventricle, the fourth ventricle, they communicate with one another. Okay, but then because the obstruction is actually here in the uh, vertex or the top part of the brain because of the scar formation in the meninges affecting the arachnoid villi or arachnoid granulations. All right, so there's really not much that you can do to reverse the scarring, right? It's a scar already. So all you need to do is place a ventricular peritoneal shunt. Right, to drain the excessive CSF into the peritoneal cavity. Right? And how will you diagnose this? Okay, again, the triad, right? If the, you're the person you're seeing, okay, has dementia, urinary incontinence, and then weight problems, then think about NPH. So what you can do is you do a lumbar puncture and try to withdraw some CSF. All right? And if there is an improvement in the symptoms, then you know the removal of the CSF improved the symptoms of the patient, suggesting that this is really, okay, this is really uh, NPH. So you recommend to the surgeon to do a ventricular peritoneal shunt. So again, this is a reversible type of dementia, okay? Uh, well, I'm not saying it's guaranteed that dementia will be reversed, but, okay, there's a high likelihood that the dementia will improve because all you need to do is drain the excessive CSF, okay? See, look. Uh, in normal pressure hydrocephalus, you can see enlargement of the ventricles, okay, and yet the pressure is normal. Okay. And pH, see, look. Of course, there will be atrophy because this is an older patient anyway, right? And there will be enlargement of the ventricle. Okay, this is the tip of the catheter, the shunt. Okay, that is draining the uh, CSF. Brain tumor, of course, this is chronic and therefore it might cause dementia. Okay, but it's reversible. All you need to do is remove the brain tumor. Okay, either surgically or radiotherapy, radiation. Okay, whole brain radiation therapy. But the problem is 
you know, there are also some uh, uh, side effects, right? It might cause uh, necrosis and fibrosis of the other parts of the brain that are not involved in the tumor. Okay. Um, even the radiotherapy itself can actually cause dementia, like I said, right? Okay. So you're trying to treat the tumor and yet the radiation can actually affect the uh, remaining uh, neurons in the other parts of the parenchyma. And therefore, that can cause dementia also, unfortunately. Okay. So you can really cannot do anything about it. Okay. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy, right? This is common among boxers, right? Why? Because of the constant hitting of the head, right? The constant head trauma okay, will eventually cause chronic traumatic encephalopathy or what we call uh, dementia pugilistica or punch drunk syndrome, all right? And this patient will eventually develop dementia or, or even Parkinsonian symptoms, okay? All right, again, cannot be reversed. There's nothing much that you can do. Okay, HIV-associated dementia, of course. Okay, uh, neurosyphilis. Like I said, the tertiary syphilis. Remember, neurosyphilis caused by treponemia pallidum is tertiary, right? Third stage. And uh, usually, by the time it reaches the third stage, the nerve system is involved already and the cardiovascular system. All right? And uh, it can affect pretty much the entire nervous system. In the brain, it can cause stroke or dementia. In the spinal cord, it can cause stabilis dorsalis. All right? In the peripheral nerves, it can cause peripheral neuropathy. All right? So the entire nervous system is at risk when you have neurosyphilis. And the good thing about it is the treponema pallidum organisms just stay there in your blood, okay, and do not cause, I mean, you know, they cause problems, but um, even though it's been years already, you can still treat them with intramuscular benzatine penicillin, okay? All right. See, look, it, by the way, in the spinal cord, it has a preferential involvement of the dorsal column. And this is what we call tabis dorsalis, or tabis dorsalis. It affects the dorsal column. And therefore, the patient's manifestation will be okay, impaired vibration and proprioception. Therefore, they tend to fall and fall and fall, okay? Because it uh, pretty much affects the dorsal column. And then, of course, eventually, it will affect the um, corticospinal tract, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, they also have Argyle Robertson pupils, right? Okay, and then positive Bromberg sign. Okay, eventually the um, patient will have uh, incontinence, impotence, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because of the involvement of the uh, autonomic nerves. Okay, remember this is how it looks, right? Spiral kits. Uh, CSF VDRL. You do a spinal tap, send it for the VDRL. Okay, it's very difficult to identify the organism using microscopy. Okay. PML, which is uh, related to HIV, right? Usually due to JC virus, right? And you will see uh, white matter abnormalities and they present with dementia. Okay, there's really not much that you can do. There's no, nothing that will kill the JC virus, okay? But at least treat the HIV of the HF. Okay, of course, alcoholic alcoholism can cause uh, uh, dementia, right? Alcoholic dementia. And then, as you know, it can cause pellagra, right? Pellagra is a nutritional deficiency, all right? Deficiency of niacin. Remember, this is the DDD. Remember the DDD board exam question. Niacin deficiency causes pellagra, which is DDD. Diarrhea, dementia, dermatitis. Okay, DDD, diarrhea, dementia, dermatitis. Niacin deficiency, pellagra. All right, so there will have they will have skin lesions, okay, not just in the hands but all over. All right, then their tongue may be involved, so they have strawberry tongue or smooth tongue. They lose the um, the normal papillae, all right, the different papillae of the tongue, okay, and therefore they it will affect their taste sensation, all right, and then there will be dementia with involved, you know, as you can see, there's atrophy, okay. Now, uh, of course, the treatment is nicotinamide, okay? So somehow it's going to help, okay? But the problem is a lot of times the neurological de deficits will persist. And there will be some improvement, okay? There is a condition called Martafaba-Bignami syndrome, 
versus actually atrophy of the corpus callosum. Okay. But it's related to uh, alcoholics with severe malnutrition. Okay, hypothyroidism, of course, will cause dementia, but you will also see other signs of hypothyroidism, like, for example, they have a slow relaxation phase of the reflexes, right? Especially in the ankle. All right. And then they have, uh, you know, bradycardia, they have uh, hypothermia. They have hypotension. Remember all the uh, clinical signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism. Vitamin B12 deficiency, like I said, it can be reversible. Okay. And vitamin B12, just like neurosyphilis, can affect the entire nervous system, right? It can cause dementia. In the spinal cord, it causes subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord, right? And then it will also cause peripheral neuropathy. Okay. So similar to uh, neurosyphilis. So they can also be reversed. Dialysis dementia, mainly due to the aluminum, right? Aluminum uh, component of the dialysis. So all you need to do is uh, do not use uh, aluminum containing dialysate when you do dialysis and, you know, it can be reversed. Okay. Vitamin B12 deficiency. This is the subacute combined degeneration. Remember, with neurosyphilis, it affects only the dorsal column. Okay. But, with subacute combined, that's why you call it combined, okay? Com combination of the posterior column and the lateral column, okay? The lateral, lateral cortical spinal tract and the spinocerebellar tract. Okay? Uh, of course, Wilson's disease can affect, can cause liver failure and then dementia and then they have for movement, okay? Pseudo-dementia, okay? Why do you call it pseudo-dementia? Meaning false dementia. Because it's not really uh, dementia, but usually due to depression, all right? So <clears throat> patients who are depressed, they will start forgetting, they will start having behavioral and, uh, you know, uh, personality changes when the reality is they're just depressed. So treatment is antidepressant, okay? Wilson's disease, remember, you have nodular degeneration of the liver because of copper deposition. That's why it's brownish to yellowish, and then you have the kaiser fleischer ring, right? The uh, copper deposits in the periphery of the cornea. Okay? And then they also have, like I said, dementia in Korea, Korea for movement. Sleep apnea, never mind. Uh, okay, and then that's it for the dementia, okay? So let me now go to the um, movement disorders. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes or yes, no? Sir. Okay, all right. Let's talk about Parkinson's first, which is the most common movement disorder, okay? And something that you will uh, encounter, and probably some of the members of your family already have it, okay? Um, remember that the uh, Parkinson's is actually, uh, Parkinson's disease involves uh, some parts of the basal nuclei or basal ganglia. Specifically, the substantia nigra of the uh, midbrain. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, these are some of the uh, abnormal movements that you may encounter. Tremors, okay, and then asterixis. Remember, asterixis is the flapping tremor, usually found in metabolic encephalopathy, all right, like hepatic encephalopathy, right? The the when you ask the patient to extend the uh, hand or the wrist joint, okay, they will flap, okay, and in fact, this is used as uh, one way of determining whether you are giving adequate treatment to hepatic encephalopathy, like that pillows, right? Uh, eventually, if there is less or this because uh, this goes away, then that means you are doing the right thing for the patient with liver failure. Okay. Korea, okay, when you have Korea, there is rapid irregular muscle jerking of the extremities or different parts of the body. All right. So whether it's you're talking about the right side, the left side, the arms, the legs, or even head and neck, okay, that can actually uh that is what you call Korea for movements or Korea. Now it may affect the person's uh gait to the point that sometimes they look like they're dancing when they walk. Okay, and they tend to have what we call milkmaid grasping, meaning they, they you know they will grasp and then release and then grasp and then release. Okay. All right, dystonia and atotosis. When you say dystonia, this is actually abnormal movements that are slow and rhythmic and sinuous and writhing in character. You know, when they look look at their hands, they, they seem to be moving in a very rhythmic way. All right? There is a rhythm. That's what you call acetosis. All right? Now, when the abnormal movements are sustained, they tend to have a posture. Okay? And when that sustained posture is present, then now you call it, okay, um, uh, dystonia. Okay? Hemibalismus, meaning one half side of the body, okay, uh, shows an involuntary movement. Actually, this is violent flinging. That's why you call it ballistic. Okay? Uh, this tends to be, that tends to occur when you get a stroke affecting the subthalamic nucleus. All right? So, you know, some of these patients even uh, shake violently only on one side. So they tend to kick the chair, kick your desk when they talk to you, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. okay. Remember, this tone, uh, atitosis is, for example, when you look at the toes of the patient, then they move in a very rhythmic way, okay, fashion. But when they assume a sustained posture, then now you call it dystonia. Okay. All right. For example, here in patients with torticolis, right, there is dystonia of the neck. That's why it, the posture is sustained. And it might be painful because the muscles are uh, stretched or, or um, contracted, right? It may be also a focal dystonia causing writer's cramp, okay? Affecting the fingers of the hand only. Now, generally, these things actually go away when they sleep. They're not present. So that's why they're still able to sleep. But once they're awake, then they start appearing again, okay? And emotional stress can actually make it worse. Myoclonus, we already talked about it, right? Rapid jerking of groups of muscles, usually the upper part of the body. So they will drop whatever they're holding, okay? And it can be epileptic or non-epileptic. If it's epileptic, of course, you treat it as a seizure. If it's non-epileptic, then you don't have to treat them as a seizure. Like, for example, as a consequence of drowning, all right? Sometimes patients twitch, okay, after they drown. And they survive, but then they twitch. Tourette syndrome is a syndrome where the patient, usually a child, okay, has a combination of vocal tics and motor tics. A okay, motor tics is like a sudden, recurrent, quick, but coordinated abnormal movements. For example, you know, uh, blinking or closing of the eye or let's say uh, mouth movements, okay, pouting of the lips. Those are motor tics or just sudden twitching of the arm the hands, etc., etc. That's the motor tick. Now, there is actually a vocal tick also, right? A barking sound, okay, clearing of the throat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I will never forget this child that I saw in the past, okay? Um, he kept saying the F word, F-U-C-K word, okay? So the mother, of course, was alarmed. You know, my child keeps saying uh, F-U-C-K, F-U-C-K, F-U-C-K. But actually, it is a vocal tic, unfortunately, okay? 
And a lot of times, okay, you do not treat this, okay? Especially if they're not that disruptive in a way, all right? It's just a little understanding in terms of the parents and the teachers, all right? Plus, you know, there are actually some medicines that we can prescribe, but these are children. So you don't want to prescribe or you don't want to be too aggressive when you try to treat them. I'm just saying that, yes, you can treat them with medications, but if, um, you know, you can explain to the parents or to the teachers, then it would be better. Okay, that's what you call Tourette syndrome or Gilles de la Torre syndrome. Now, let's go to Parkinson's. Okay, Parkinson's, the problem with Parkinson's is that there is degeneration of the dopam dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra of the midbrain. These dopaminergic neurons also produce melanin. All right? That's why in the, in, uh, the uh, substantia nigra, okay, it appears dark in the midbrain, right? Because of the melanin that is produced. But again, it also produces dopamine. And remember that in order to affect normal movement, there has to be a balance between acetylcholine and dopamine. And because in Parkinson's, there's degeneration of the dopaminergic neurons, then the dopamine will be less. The dopamine will become deficient. So now, even though there's no absolute increase in the acetylcholine, the acetylcholine will predominate. Okay, And as a result, the patient presents with abnormal uh, movements, okay? They may have bradykinesia or hypokinesia, right? Brady meaning slow, okay? Like, for example, your grandpa has Parkinson's and your grandpa's watching TV. If you call your grandpa from the side, grandpa, grandpa, right? Instead of uh, looking quickly, your grandpa will take forever before he can make a turn of the head or his body, okay? Or getting in and out of the car is going to be very difficult because they have bradykinesia, very slow, okay? They may actually oh, look at this. This is the substantial nigra. All right. But see, darkly staining because of the melanin. But these neurons also produce dopamine. Or movement okay look at this patient who died from uh, something and then the patient also had parkinson's right it becomes lightly staining already because there is degeneration of the dopaminergic neurons that produce melanin all right they normally you see a lot of neurons but then here you, you only see one two three four the rest are glial cells okay see look at the melanin Okay, this is uh, substantial nigra, normal, and then this is with Parkinson's. Okay, this is the balance I'm talking about. Normally, for us to normal to move normally, there has to be a balance between dopamine and acetylcholine. But in Parkinson's, there is less dopamine. Okay, therefore, the acetylcholine will predominate. There's no absolute increase. Remember that. There's nothing that will increase uh, or produce more acetylcholine. But because dopamine is less, the balance is tilted towards the acetylcholine, right? So there is a relative increase in acetylcholine, not absolute increase. Okay? All right. So they will present with tremor, right? The tremor that they have is actually pill rolling. When you look closely, look at their fingers, you will see that they look like they're rolling a pill or capsule between their fingers. And then it is a resting type of tremor, meaning when the hands are at rest, the more they become prominent, right? When, but when the hand is holding something or busy, then it becomes less prominent, but it's still there, okay? And then they have rigidity. That's, that's why they look like robots, right? The way they walk, they look like robots, okay? And then they have micrographia, okay? Micrographia is very small handwriting, okay? Uh, initially, okay, their, their handwriting will be normal, but then as time goes on, they will write in smaller and smaller and smaller uh, form or letters, and therefore, it becomes difficult to read them, okay? All right, this is a PET scan showing you, this is a healthy, okay, substantia nigra, and look, here, it is reduced in size. Okay, they will have, Okay, again, bradykinesia or hypokinesia, and then they have an abnormal gait and posture, right? Their gait is shuffling or fascinating, meaning they walk 
with small steps and then to the point that sometimes they look like they're running, but it's because they are walking in small steps, All right? They have mass phase. Their facial expression becomes reduced because they have rigidity of the muscles of the face also, right? Okay, and then they have blepharospasm, blepharoclonus, meaning fluttering of the closed eyelids or involuntary closure of the eyelid. Okay, and then they may have what we call Myerson sign. If you repeatedly tap the labella right here, the bridge of the nose, then they will keep on blinking. Whereas normally, if you do that to yourself, you tap your glabella, then you don't necessarily blink, right? Frequently. But with them, every time you tap it, it will blink. Okay? And then, uh, you see, this is what you call blepharoclonus. Okay? And then they have mask face, meaning blank facial expression because of rigidity of the facial muscles. Okay? They are slow, bradykinetic, and rigid. Okay, this is normal spiral, whereas a person with Parkinson's, their spiral becomes smaller and shaky because of the tremor. All right, and then they have cogwheel rigidity. When you say cogwheel rigidity, it means that when you check the muscle tone, okay, instead of getting smooth muscle, you will feel that it's broken, like, how do I say it? Like down, 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 down. It's like broken into uh, several movements rather than smooth. All right, that's cogwheel rigidity. Okay. And then, of course, they also have non-motor manifestations. They have anosmia or they lack sense of smell. Okay, They have dementia, cognitive decline. They may have anxiety or depression, behavioral changes. They have apathy, meaning they become apathetic. You know, They don't care. All right? They just sit there quietly. Okay. Even though somebody is, uh, is uh, yelling fire already or earthquake or something, right? They have fatigue. All right, they have uh, urinary symptoms. They have sleep disorders like, um, um, what's called this? Um, they cannot sleep, all right, at night. Okay, and then, um, you know, treatment. Of course, there are many medicines, many medicines that are available now, but the, the one that is time-tested, that has been in use for many years now, is the levodopa with carbidopa, okay? The levodopa and carbidopa, let me, all right, there, here, okay? The levodopa, how does it work, okay? If you use, remember, the problem here is they don't have enough dopamine, right? The brain does not have enough dopamine because there's degeneration of the dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra. So all you need to do is replace the do dopamine by giving levodopa, right? But the problem here is this. If you're going to give, please pay attention, okay? If you're going to give levodopa alone, right? The problem is, in the blood, when you swallow it, of course, it will eventually get metabolized and then go to the blood, right? In the blood, there is dopa decarboxylase, which is a catabolic enzyme. So it will degrade the levodopa in the blood, okay? And it will become dopamine, right? And that's exactly what the brain needs, dopamine. But the problem here is that the dopamine cannot cross the blood-brain barrier, okay? So, okay, of course, the L-DOPA itself can cross the blood-brain barrier, but by the time it reaches the brain, it is reduced from 100% to only 10%. So now, the DOPA decarboxylase in the brain will now catabolize the L-DOPA into dopamine, and you can use it. But then, it's only 10%, right? So now, the practice is you prescribe levodopa in combination with carbidopa. This is a favorite board exam question. Almost every year, this is given board exam. Why? What's the mechanism behind adding carbidopa to levodopa in treatment with Parkinson's? Okay? Because if you're going to give carbidopa, which is this molecule, the carbidopa cannot cross the blood-brain barrier, but it can actually inactivate or inhibit the dopa decarboxylase. Therefore, if it inhibits the enzyme that will catabolize the L-dopa, you know, at least the L-dopa will cross the blood-brain barrier and then it will be catabolized already in the brain by the dopa decarboxylase. Okay, I hope everybody got that. Okay, if you combine carbidopa, the carbidopa cannot cross the blood-brain barrier, but it can deactivate or inhibit the dopa decarboxylase. Okay, and therefore the L-dopa the 100% uh, 
okay, by the time it reaches the brain, it's only 80%. And that's okay, 80%. Rather better, much better than 10% only. Right? Because the carbon dopa will inhibit the dopa decarboxylase. Okay? All right. That's the mechanism behind combining levodopa with carbon dopa. If you give levodopa alone, okay, yeah, it can cross the blood-brain barrier, but it is reduced to 10% because it is catabolized by dopa decarboxylase. All right, so you need to inhibit the dopa decarboxylase in the blood so that more molecules, maybe 90% of the old dopa, can cross the blood barrier. And then inside, in the brain, that's when, that's where the dopa decarboxylase will act on it to catabolize it into dopamine. And now you have the dopamine to affect normal movement, movement. So you are trying to restore the balance between dopamine and acetylcholine. Okay, so you reduce the symptoms of Parkinson's. But then again, Parkinson's is a lifetime diagnosis. You cannot escape, right? Once you have Parkinson's, you will have Parkinson's for life. But at least there are uh, several medicines that you can prescribe okay, to uh, minimize the Parkinsonian uh, abnormalities. Okay? Okay, that's all you need to know about Parkinson's. And now there are surgical operations in the brain that you can that doctors do. All right, they can actually do a deep brain simulation. Okay, I used to do this and it really worked. Okay, a lot of these patients respond to DBS or deep brain stimulation. So basically, surgeon is going to place a neurostimulator under the skin subcutaneously here in the chest. Okay, and it is it is connected to the leads which will be placed in the brain, okay, and that will actually um, stimulate the subthalamic nucleus, okay? All right, and a lot of times this is very helpful. However, okay, the patients thinking that this is really a brain surgery, then they're scared, which you cannot blame them, right? No one wants to have brain surgery. But some people who are, uh, you know, courageous or bold or whatever, they accept the surgical procedure. It's a minor, it's not, I don't want to say minor, but, uh, it, you know, it's not like your brain is going to be chopped off, etc., etc. All you need to do is insert the lead with this, um, you know, uh, small uh, tip to touch the subthalamic nucleus to stimulate it, okay? But, again to each his own. If the, your grandpa or grandma doesn't want it, then they will just stick with medication. All right, that's all for the Parkinson's. Now let's go to stroke. All right, I'm deleting the neuromuscular junction disorders. All right, because the stroke is something that's too uh, extensive, all right? All right, neurovascular disorders, meaning the vessels in the brain and spinal cord, okay? All right, stroke, remember, is a syndrome. And there are four key features, right? Number one, acute. There's no such thing as chronic stroke, okay? All right, acute stroke. And then second is there's focal involvement of the CNS, right? It's, you know, when you say stroke, it affects only a certain part of the central nervous system, brain or spinal cord, right? Uh, it doesn't affect the entire brain and spinal cord. Okay, only focal because it is vascular etiology. It is a vascular etiology, meaning depending on which blood vessels involved, then that's how the stroke will affect your brain, right? And then there's lack of rapid resolution, right? This do not go away. Unlike meningitis, you give antibiotics, it will clear, right? But with stroke, there's no such thing, all right? There's no rapid resolution, okay? And therefore, a lot of these neurological deficits may persist. Okay, all right. And TIA means that, technically speaking, when you say TIA, that means that there is transient occlusion of blood vessels or transient uh, impediment in the blood flow, and therefore that part of the brain will get deprived of oxygen, but it's only temporary. Okay, the technical definition is the neurological deficits persist for 24 hours or less, not more than 24 hours. Okay. All right, which means that probably, if let's say there is a blood clot, there's an embolus, then eventually the embolus will uh, dissolve on its own, and therefore the blood supply is restored. Or if there's occlusion, the occlusion okay, will eventually um, go away, and therefore the blood supply is restored. Okay, that's what you call TIA. 
All right now, there is what we call stroke in evolution, meaning stroke, okay, uh, keeps on getting worse and worse and worse and worse. That's why initially, let's say you saw the patient initially, the patient is paralyzed only on the right side. But then four hours later, six hours later, the patient is now cannot speak. Whereas in the beginning, he was able to speak. It's not because there's another new stroke. It's because the stroke is evolving. Okay, and then another one is completed stroke, where you know as soon as you see the patient, it's completed already. So you have a plateau. Okay, all right. Now, what are some of the uh, stroke risk factors? What are the things that will uh, predispose you to getting a stroke? Of course, older age, right? They, they say the they say that the cutoff is sixty five. Once you reach sixty five, your risk of getting a stroke becomes higher. Although stroke can happen in young adults, whatever, but usually in the older people, right? Male gender seems to be a risk factor, and that's probably because of the protective uh, uh, effect of the female hormones, right? Okay, low birth weight and family history. Now, those are non-modifiable. You cannot change them anymore, right? But there are modifiable risk factors, meaning risk factors that you can change. For example, cigarette smoking, blood pressure, right? Carotid stenosis, okay, peripheral artery disease, atrial fibrillation, congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease, endocrine, diabetes, birth control pills, right? Okay, cholesterol, obesity, sickle cell disease, lifestyle, right? Uh, you know, let's like say, for example, sedentary lifestyle. All you do is sit down and then sleep, sit down, sleep, just like what's happening now in uh, lockdown, right? We are trapped in our homes and therefore we don't have a lot of physical activity. Therefore, we are at risk for getting a stroke. So these are the modifiable risk factors, meaning you can do something as opposed to non-modifiable, okay? All right, now when you say blood vessels in the brain, you're actually referring to two types, okay? There's actually called anterior circulation and there's posterior circulation. Please take note, okay? Anterior circulation is mainly uh, due to internal carotid artery. Remember, this is a common carotid, which will divide into external and internal. So it's actually the internal, okay? So in other words, anterior circulation refers to the internal carotid artery and its branches. All right, whereas the posterior circulation okay, refers to the vertebrobasilar system, vertebral artery, and then, of course, they unite to form the single basilar artery. And they are, they anastomose with one another in the circle of Willis area, right? The base of the brain, circle of Willis. Okay, all right. So let's talk about the anterior circulation. When you say anterior, well, anterior posterior okay when you say anterior circulation okay you are referring to the two main branches which are anterior cerebral and middle cerebral right if you look at the brain you will see that a big portion of the lateral aspect of the brain is supplied by the middle cerebral artery the green right the green middle cerebral okay whereas the anterior cerebral artery supplies the parasagittal area and the inner surface of the brain Okay, this is now the inner surface of the medial surface, right? It's mainly supplied by the anterior cerebral artery and the parasagittal area. Okay, and then of course, right here, see the inner surface of the brain and the parasagittal area. Now, the middle cerebral artery supplies a big part of the lateral convexity and a portion of the um, corpus callosum. Okay, and of course, the posterior cerebral artery, which is part of the posterior circulation supplies mainly the posterior part and the inferior part, okay? Okay, so now, what are some of the territories of the anterior cerebral and posterior cerebral, right? We just talked about it. The anterior cerebral will supply the median, medial surface, right? The parasagittal area, okay? Meaning, it will affect mainly the trunk and the legs and the feet. Okay, the middle cerebral artery will supply a big portion of the cerebral hemisphere, right? So it will affect this part. And then the posterior cerebral artery will affect mainly the posterior aspect and the inferior aspect. Okay, so here, considering the homunculus, okay, then, okay, the middle cerebral artery will affect the head and neck and the arm, whereas the trunk and the legs are mainly 
uh, involved in anterior cerebral artery. Okay. So here, if you're going to do a coronal section or a um, frontal section of the brain, this area is supplied by the anterior cerebral, mainly the leg part, right? Okay, and this big portion is supplied by the middle cerebral, okay? And then the PCA will supply the inferior aspect and, of course, the thalamus. All right, so let's talk about anterior circulation, which is mainly related to the internal carotid, right? What are the branches of internal carotid? Okay, the ACA, the MCA, okay, the posterior communicating artery, not posterior cerebral artery, but posterior communicating artery, and of course, the ophthalmic and the anterior choroidal. These are involved mainly in the uh, eye, right? It goes to the orbit, and it supplies the retina through the central retinal artery, right? Okay, and then the anterior choroidal mainly uh, supplies the choroid plexus, right, which produces CSF, okay, and then the ACA, the MCA, and the still communicating artery, all right? Now, when you have blockage of the anterior circulation, okay, you may present with aphasia because of involvement of the Broca's area, Wernicke's area, right? You may have apraxia because of the involvement of the uh, supplementary or association motor cortex, Okay, and of course, agnosia. Agnosia is inability to recognize okay, through the use of uh, the sense organs, right? Okay, or the senses. All right, and then of course, you may have hemiparesis because of primary motor cortex, hemisensory loss because of the primary sensory cortex, visual field defects because of the visual radiation or optic radiation, right? Remember, the temporal and the parietal. Okay, but this can actually occur in posterior circulation stroke also, right? Hemiparesis, hemisensory loss, and visual field. Okay, so the anterior cerebral artery will supply the inner surface, right? So mainly here, okay, it even follows the contour of the, um, uh, the corpus callosum, right? The pericolosal artery. So if you have a blockage of the anterior cerebral artery, what part of the body will be paralyzed or numb? Anyone? Frontal lobe. No, what part of the what part of the body will be weak or numb? This is the inner surface. Remember, remember, this is the inner surface based on among Arms and legs. The, the leg. Trunk and leg. The, leg. the trunk and the legs, correct. The trunk and the legs. But because in the trunk we don't really move a lot then it's really the leg that will become paralyzed or weak or numb, right? Because, please take care of that, okay? If it's an anterior cerebral artery, it will be the leg that will, that, will, that will be mostly affected because the leg part in the homunculus is in the inner surface, right? Okay. How about middle cerebral artery? Of course, you may uh, have involvement of the frontal eye field, so the eyes will deviate to one side. It will affect the primary motor, Right, and therefore you will become hemiparetic or hemiplegic. You may have hemisensory loss because of the primary sensory. You may have problem with reading and writing because of the angular gyrus. Okay, and of course sensory. Okay, the cortical sensory integration. Remember the agraphasia. Okay, astereognosis, etc., etc., and then even the temporal lobe. Okay, so it may you may have Wernicke's aphasia. Okay, and then of course the hearing. You will not really have hearing deficit, but mainly what? What, what? what did we learn in the localization? The hearing will not be affected because you have bilateral uh, projections to the, you know, the other side is still working. But the problem is you will not be able to what? Locate the sound. Yes, very good. You very good. You will not be able to locate the source of the sound, right? Remember the example that I gave you yesterday? A dog is barking, okay, you can hear the barking of the dog, but you cannot identify where it's coming from, okay? Yes, sir. That's a problem with primary auditory cortex. But with secondary auditory cortex, the problem is what? You, you look at the sound, but you can't interpret the sound. Very good, okay, very good. If it's secondary uh, auditory cortex, okay, you will not be able to interpret the sound okay the dog is barking so you're concerned why you know in the middle of the night maybe there's a rubber entering the house right but you are not able to interpret the sound okay you can hear it but there's no interpretation 
Okay, all right. So, because this is the middle cerebral artery, right? But the middle cerebral artery will divide into superior division and inferior division. Superior is the one that goes to the right frontoparietal area, whereas the uh, inferior division is the one that goes to the temporal lobe mainly. Okay? Now, this middle cerebral artery will send off branches or deep penetrating small branches to the basal ganglia and the internal capsule. Okay, see, look at this, small. These are what we call lenticulostriate arteries. And these are small branches of the middle cerebral artery. Okay, all right. Now, let's go to the posterior circulation, which is mainly vertebrobasilar, right? What are the branches of the this vertebrobasilar system? Okay, you have the pica, posterior inferior cerebellar artery. You have the ICA. You have the SCA, superior cerebellar, and of course, the PCA. Okay, so they supply the brain stem, the cerebellum, the thalamus, and of course, part of the occipital and temporal lobes. Okay. The PCA gives off branches, okay, the thalamoperforate and thalamogeniculate because they go to the thalamus. Okay, now, what will happen if you have posterior circulation stroke? You can become comatose. Why? Anyone? Why can you become comatose if it's posterior circulation? What controls consciousness or awareness? Ah, we discussed that yesterday. The brain stem. Yes, the brain stem. Why? What's special in the brain stem? Because of the reticular. Yes, very good. You know, just based on today's discussion, it looks like only one person will pass the exam next week. All right. So because in the brainstem, that's where you have the reticular formation or reticular activating system, which is responsible for awareness, wakefulness, and consciousness. So if you have infarct of the posterior circulation, the brainstem will be involved, you can become comatose. All right? Now, you can get drop attacks, sudden collapse without loss of consciousness. Okay, this is because of the involvement of the brainstem, pons, et cetera, et cetera, because that's where you will find the, remember, the corticospinal tract, right? The... Um, the um, medullary pyramids, et cetera, et cetera, the motor fibers, okay? Now, you may have vertigo, dizziness, nausea, and vomiting. Why, why do you have vertigo? Because of, it's where you find the nucleus of the vestibulocochlear nerve, right? The vestibulocochlear nerve, right? Okay, therefore, you may have vertigo, nausea, vomiting. Remember, this is the brain stem. This is where you have the cranial nerves, right? Okay, cranial nerve palsies, of course, right? Ataxia, why? Because of the cerebellum, right? Now, here in the brainstem, okay, you will have sensory motor deficits that are crossed. What does that mean, crossed? Meaning maybe there, there's numbness to the right side of the face, and yet in the body, it's on the left side. And that's because of the decusation of the fibers, okay? If the sensory motor deficits are crossed, meaning, again, face one side and then the body and the arm and leg on the other side, then that's what you call crossed. So your localization is brainstem. So it is actually posterior circulation. Now, remember, in the anterior, you may have hemiparesis, right? Because of the um, front, uh, what they call this, primary motor cortex, right? The hemisensory disturbances, primary sensory. Okay, and visual field deficit because of the optic radiations. Okay, but even in posterior, you can have them, hemiparesis, hemisensory loss, and visual field. Why? Because hemiparesis, remember, again, because of the cortical uh, spinal fibers, medullary pyramid, right? The crucerebri, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then the hemisensory disturbances, same thing, right? Lateral spinothalamic tract, et cetera, et cetera. Visual field because of the visual radiations in the um, posterior aspect, like the occipital lobe, et cetera, et cetera. So these are not specific to posterior circulation, even anterior can have hemiparesis, hemisensory loss, and visual field. But all these things are exclusively to the posterior circulation. Okay? All right, see? They, this is the posterior circulation. Remember, the vertebral basilar. You have two vertebral arteries passing through the transverse foramina of the cervical vertebrae. And then once they reach the uh, brainstem, they will unite to form a single midline basilar artery. That's why if it's... A lot of times, if it's a uh, posterior circulation, it's bilateral because there's only one basilar artery in the middle. So it will affect both sides. 
Okay? All right. And then, of course, the anterior circulation is internal, internal carotid, right? Okay, with, uh, you know, uh, circumcommunicating artery. And then the anterior cerebral, okay? And the anterior communicating artery. So now, they will anastomose with one another or connect with one another in the area of the circle of Willis. The middle cerebral artery is not, technically speaking, it's not part of the circle of Willis because it's outside already, not part of the circle. Okay, all right. Circle of Willis, this is an angiogram. See, the two vertebral arteries uniting to form the midline basilar artery. Okay, even the midbrain pons and medulla have specific blood supply. Okay, all right. So let's look at these symptoms. Headache. Headache can be present in both anterior and posterior, but mainly in the anterior. Why? Because, because if you have a stroke, that will cause cere massive cerebral edema, right? And of course, if it's the big artery, the middle cerebral artery, anterior cerebral artery, okay, that is uh, involved, then you, you can get, uh, you know, a uh, headache because of the increase. Uh, because of the massive edema, all right? Altered consciousness, okay? Mainly in the posterior because of the reticular formation. But why can you have altered consciousness in the anterior? Because remember, consciousness is also controlled by bilateral cortices, the cerebral cortex, right? And that's anterior, cerebral cortex, all right? Aphasia, definitely zero in posterior because you don't have speech centers in the posterior, only in the anterior, okay? All right. Visual field defect, both sides, right? Because of the visual radiations. Diplopia, why only in the posterior and not in the anterior? Anyone? Why don't why do you see double vision only in the posterior circulation stroke and not anterior? Well, because that's because of the remember, you have a diplopia if the eyeballs are not together anymore, right? So there's extra ocular muscles. And that's part of the cranial nerves, right? And cranial nerves is in the posterior and not in the anterior. That's why it's zero, okay? Why do you get vertigo only in the posterior and not in the anterior? Again, it's related to the cranial nerves, right? The nuclei of the cochlear nucleus, vertigo. Or it can also be in the cerebellum, right? Okay, it's arthria. This arthria, not aphasia, okay? Aphasia means the broca's area, vertigus area, right? This arthria is just problem with articulation, the way you speak, okay? And that's because of the impairment of the muscles of the larynx, pharynx, muscles of the tongue, muscles of the soft palate, orbicularis oculi, I mean, oris, etc., etc. So this arteria is mainly, both sides, of course, okay, but mainly in the posterior because of those things that I mentioned. Drop attacks, of course, because of posterior and not in the anterior. Hemiparesis, both sides. Okay, hemisensory loss, both sides. Okay, but mainly in the anterior because of the primary motor cortex and the primary sensory cortex. Okay, so if you know your neuroanatomy, everything comes easy. Okay, all right. Now, when you say ischemia to the brain, okay, it depends on the pattern. Okay, in the mild ischemia, for example, you had a cardiac arrest, right? But eventually, you, you're, uh, you, you are revived, right? Quickly because of, uh, you know, uh, because of the cooperation of the nurses and doctors, right? So let's say you had cardiac arrest, but you're revived, okay? So there will be mild ischemia, and there will be selective vulnerability of the neurons, okay? If it's more severe, okay, then, of course, it's not just the neurons that are affected, but even the glial cells and the cells of the blood vessels, the endothelium, okay? If it's complete permanent ischemia, then it becomes what we call pan-necrosis, meaning pan, meaning all of them. So it will affect all the cells, the neurons, the glial cells, and the uh, endothelium. And therefore, as time goes on, it will result in chronic cavitary lesions. There's a cavity that will be formed because, you know, the cells will die, right? Okay? Now, the... Um, of course, there's what you call brain edema, physiogenic edema, all right? There will be swelling of the uh, uh, neurons in the brain, and therefore, they are actually maximal at two to three days, okay? So this is the reason why sometimes in the on the first day, 
the patient is still talking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then on the second or third day, there's aphasia already, right? Or the patient dies. That's because there is edema that is produced and it's maximal at two to three days. And it may cause herniation. Okay? All right. And things that can happen is thrombosis and embolism, right? Remember, there are two things that can happen. There will be uh, thrombosis, meaning there is a uh, uh, narrowing of the uh, cavity of the blood vessel, right? Or embolism, there is a blood clot that traveled from one area to another, okay? This is what happens when you uh, have a stroke, okay? There is... You know, the, the, that part of the brain that got deprived of oxygen will be divided into layers, okay? The most superficial, uh, the most peripheral layers, okay, are the ones that can be saved uh, compared to the inner ones, okay? Because, you know, they are the innermost part. And therefore, okay, the, the, the blood vessels that penetrate the brain, okay, will have to go all the way to supply the innermost part. So if you block that artery, then the innermost part will be the ones that will be most susceptible. And that's what you call core of the infarct, infarct core. Okay, and then the periphery is called the penumbra, the blue part. Okay, all right. Within 30 minutes, this is actually what's going to happen. Okay, the, the, the infarct core will be small, meaning the, this is the one that will die. All right, we're talking about stroke now, right? A definite uh, injury. So the core will die, okay? And then the peripheral part, after 30 minutes, can still be saved. But after two hours, let's say you don't do anything, okay? Then the core will now increase in size, right? There will be more neurons that will die, and then the penumbra will decrease in size. After 12 hours, okay, this will be dead already. Okay, there was no more penumbra. All, all the neurons that got deprived of oxygen will die. Okay? So you have a core and you have a penumbra. All right. Now, there are two ways, two mechanisms, right? One is thrombosis or occlusion of the blood vessel. The other one is embolism. There's a blood clot, okay, coming from one area and then travels to another area. Okay? Now, thrombosis... Symptoms typically evolve over minutes to hours, whereas embolism actually is maximal from the very beginning. If this embolus will block the middle cerebral artery, then the neurological deficit, deficits will be maximal at the onset, right? Whereas this one, thrombosis, you know, the, the narrowing, okay, uh, will be slow. It's not really maximal at the onset, okay, but it will evolve over minutes to hours, Okay. All right, so what are the things that happen when you have injury, all right? For example, ischemia, like I said, okay, stroke. Of course, first, there will be energy failure, right? Because of low oxygen, so there will be low, low, less ATP available, et cetera, et cetera. And then eventually, there will be disturbance in the ion gradients. Remember, the cell membrane, the sodium potassium ATP is pumped. You know, they're all dependent on energy and oxygen. And then there will be calcium dysregulation. And excitotoxicity of the uh, neurons, this is a negative effect. Okay, excitotoxicity because of the glutamine. All right, and then there will be oxidative and nitrosative injury, and eventually cell death processes, and then even inflammation will now set in, and the neurons will eventually die. Okay, remember, neurons are very, very sensitive to low oxygen. Okay. The first line of defense, every time there's a, a thrombosis or occlusion or embolism, okay, the first line of defense against ischemia is collateral circulation. All right? Remember, that's the purpose of collateral circulation. That's the reason for the anastomosis, right? So that if you block one of them, then the other one will try to compensate. And these are some of the collateral circulations available in the brain, right? Bilateral vertebral artery occlusion and pure spinal artery will try to compensate and so forth and so on. And remember, with the macular sparing, right? Macular sparing in the occipital lobe, that's because of the anastomosis between uh, middle cerebral artery and posterior cerebral artery. Okay? All right? Remember, uh, we just said that if you have occlusion of both vertebral artery, then the anterior spinal artery will try to compensate because it's still there. This is just one example. Okay? All right, this is the macular sparing. Homonymous hemianopia with macular sparing. That's because the macular part of the occipital lobe uh, is 
actually supplied uh, both by the MCA and the PCA. Okay? All right. So, you know, occlusion of the arteries, it doesn't choose any. It can affect the large arteries. It can affect the medium-sized or even the small artery. Okay? These are examples of large artery occlusion. See? Here, what artery do you think is involved here? Anterior yes, cerebral. Huh? Anterior cerebral artery. Okay. Anterior cerebral artery, right? Because this is the median surface, right? This is the parasagittal area. The leg. Remember, the homunculus, the, the trunk is here. The leg and foot is here. And then the arm is here, the head, the tongue, the mouth, right? Okay, so if you recall your homunculus, this inner surface is supplied by the ACA. So the patient who owns this uh, brain, okay, when he was alive, probably he was paralyzed in the leg and foot area. How about this one? What artery? Middle cerebral. Okay, very good. Middle cerebral artery because it's... Okay, let's be more specific. What division? Is it the superior division or the inferior division? Superior. Superior, okay, because this is the parietal, right? Okay, and this is the temporal. And temporal is inferior division. Okay, very good. All right, how about this one? What specific arteries are involved here? Uh, inferior, uh, inferior division of middle cerebral artery. Well... It's actually the lenticular straight the lenticular artery. Lenticular artery. Ah, okay, very good, right? The lenticular straight branches of the middle cerebral artery because this is now the inner part, right? Okay, this supplies the basal ganglia and the uh, internal capsule. Very good, okay? Now, this is the, the effect. Eventually, it will form a cavity. A cavitary lesion because the cells here got the of oxygen and they died. So they will be they will disintegrate and the cell debris, cellular debris, will be eaten up or phagocytosed by the um, macrophages. And what are the macrophages in the brain? What do you call them? Astrocytes. Ah, Astrocytes. Microglia. microglia, okay. Remember, the macrophages in the brain are the microglia. The astrocytes are mainly for support, all right? Oligodendrocytes for production of myelin. Ependymal cells for lining the ventricles, and therefore they produce um, CSF, okay? All right. Now, these are strokes that are caused by occlusion of small penetrating branches, okay? See, you see this? multiple uh, infarcts that are small, okay? And this is a lacunar infarct. By the way, a small infarct is called lacunar infarct. And usually it means there's an occlusion of a small branch only. Now here, this is the pons. And then you have a small lacunar infarct here. Here are the lenticular straight branches, right? Okay, which are branches of the middle cerebral artery, supplying the basal ganglia and the internal capsule. All right, see the lenticular straight arteries. Okay, this is a small lacunar infarct. Another lacunar infarct. Okay, all right. Now, uh, this is actually a large vessel, middle cerebral artery, specifically superior division. Okay, and eventually you will have a cavitary lesion. Imagine a big chunk of your brain is gone because they died. Well, our infarct in the pons again. Okay, how about the clinical anatomic correlation? Again, when it comes to ACA, it's mainly paralysis or sensory loss exclusively or primarily affecting the leg. Now, it's not only this, right? Patients may actually have abulia or apathy. Okay, apathetic, just like Parkinson's, right? Okay, they may also have alien hand uh, syndromes or disconnection syndrome because it involves the corpus callosum, right? There will be disconnection syndrome. And then there is going to be transcortical expressive aphasia, not the complete expressive aphasia, but transcortical, meaning the area close to the uh, Broca's area. And then there will be urinary incontinence because the uh, 
part of the brain that controls urination is in the inner surface or median surface. Okay. Hold on a second. All right, so um, let's go to the next. All right, so um, this is the homunculus. See, look at the leg and the foot. They're actually in the inner surface. I hope everybody understands what I'm telling you. I, I think I've mentioned it so many times already, even in neurology, your regular class, that the leg and the foot is found here in the inner surface, in the middle. Okay, and therefore, this is supplied by anterior cerebral artery, right? And therefore... The patient, if you have a blockage of the HCA or anterior cerebral artery, it will manifest mainly in the leg. And there will be a urinary problem, right? Because the genital area is found here. Okay? And then this is supplied by the middle cerebral artery, a big part. And therefore, it will manifest in the arm, the hand, and the face. Okay? All right. The middle cerebral artery. All right, this supplies a big portion. This is uh, the biggest branch of the internal carotid artery, right? It has two divisions, the superior division and the inferior division. The superior division is mainly the primary motor and primary sensory cortex, okay? Mainly of the face, the arm, and the hand, not the leg, because the leg is anterior cerebral artery, okay? So it also affects the Broca's area. And, of course, the frontal eye field, all right? Now, the inferior division is the one that mainly goes to the temporal lobe. So it will affect the visual radiations mainly okay, and the Wernicke's area. The lenticular straight branches will supply the basal ganglia and the internal capsule. Okay. Mm. The leg and the foot, anterior cerebral artery. Okay, urinary incontinence because the genital is here. Okay, the arm, the hand, and the face is mainly middle cerebral artery. So if you have a blockage of the um, superior division of the middle cerebral artery, you will become hemiplegic or hemiplegic, but usually the leg is spared because the leg is anterior, not middle. Okay, so if you know this, then everything will come easy, right? Okay, because... The middle cerebral artery will supply pretty much all these. The frontal eye field, Broca's area, primary motor, primary sensory, even the angular gyrus here, okay, the Wernicke's area, and then the primary auditory. Okay, please remember the primary auditory is secondary auditory cortex. Okay, primary auditory, there's no hearing loss that will occur if you have a lesion in the cortex, right? Because the other side can compensate. But if it's the primary auditory cortex, then you will not be able to locate the source of the sound. If it's the secondary auditory cortex, you will not be able to interpret the sound. Okay? All right. Superior division. If you're division, you already know. Okay? Superior division. See, the middle cerebral artery will go up, right? And go laterally. And we, it will send off the lenticular straight branches going to the basal ganglia and ventral capsule. All right, but it will divide into superior division and inferior division. The inferior is the one that goes to the temporal lobe, and the superior is the one that goes to the frontoparietal area. Okay, lenticular striate, supplying the basal ganglia and the internal capsule. Superior division of the MCA, inferior division of the MCA. Okay, this is the anterior cerebral going to the midline. Okay. So if you know, uh, if every, everything will come easy. It's going to be easy for you to identify the symptoms that will happen to the patient. If you know this, what we've been discussing in terms of neuroanatomy. Okay. Basilar artery, okay, usually affects by, uh, you know, the patient manifests bilaterally because it's midline. It's in the middle. So it will affect both right and the left. That's why coma can be a manifestation, right? Because the reticular activating system found in the brainstem will be affected. Okay, and then the patient will be quadriparetic or uh, yeah, quadriplegic. This is both sides.
Okay, now let's concentrate on the uh, what will you do if you encounter uh, a patient with stroke? Let's say you admitted a patient with stroke in the ER. Okay. Of course, you have to have knowledge of neuroanatomy in order for you to identify whether it's a big or large artery stroke or a small artery stroke or lacunar infarct. Because between the two, it's more dangerous. The one that's more fatal or more dangerous is the um, the uh, you know large artery stroke, right? For example, the MCA, the ACA, PCA, because it's a large artery. So there will be massive edema. Whereas if it's lacunar infarct, it's only a small stroke because it's only, it only involves a small penetrating uh, artery. But it doesn't mean there's no cerebral edema that will occur, right? Stro uh, infarct is always associated with edema, but the size of the edema will be small also in lacunar infarct. Okay? So what will you do when you admit these types of patients? Of course, you will, uh, you know... Uh, I, the very important question that you need to ask the patient or the family member is, when did the symptoms start? Why is it important to identify the onset of the symptoms? Anyone? So that we can provide the appropriate treatment. What kind of treatment are we talking about? In emergency, we can use TPA patients yes. in, in four to five hours. Okay, very good. Because of the TPA, right? Remember, the tissue plasminogen activator or the clot buster, they say, all right, is supposed to be a wonder drug, all right? It's supposed to dissolve blood clots if you give it on time, okay? And the golden period is how many hours? Uh, 4.5, four, uh, 4 hours. 4 to 5 hours. Oops. Okay, if, if the uh, the doctor, I, sorry, if the wife, for example, let's say it is the, the, the father, okay, that had a stroke. And then you ask, okay, when did uh, he start having problems with his walking or when did he start having double vision or when did he start having paralysis of the right side and let's say the wife tells you um doctor i was already in bed and he was in also in bed but he was watching tv and then he went to sleep and then when he woke up that's when he fell to the floor because his right side was paralyzed what do you think shall you give tpa or not You can try antiplatelets, sir. Well, okay. Actually, I'm, I'm asking about the TPA, okay? You cannot give it because you cannot identify the exact onset, right? Remember, the golden period, okay? The golden period of three hours, okay? Sometimes four hours, it depends again, all right? So if, you, if the patient or the family cannot exactly tell you the onset, then there's no way that you're going to give it. Because if you give it, and if it's more than the golden period, the patient will bleed, all right? Because remember, it's supposed to dissolve the blood clot, but if you give it beyond that time, then the patient might bleed, right? That's a side effect, okay? So it's also, uh, uh, you know, a heavy-duty medication. That's why you have to be careful when you give it, okay? The onset is very important. If the patient cannot tell you the exact time, then do not give the TPA anymore, okay? Now, generally, okay, you want to give TPA, right? Now, there are certain indications and contraindications. You cannot give TPA all the time. In fact, uh, only neurologists are allowed to give a go signal okay, for giving the TPA. In fact, okay, uh, only neurologists can give the TPA. Okay? Without the neurologist, you cannot give the TPA, basically. We're, we're talking about stroke. Okay? We're not talking about giving TPA for uh, myocardial infarction. I'm talking about stroke. Okay? All right. So remember, you're going to give it intravenous, right? Okay. So the golden period is three hours. Now, um, if it's beyond three hours, then don't give it anymore. And then other contraindications are, of course, number one, if the patient had recent surgery. You cannot give the TPA if the patient had the recent surgery, meaning surgery in the past month, the past three weeks, right? Because the patient might bleed. Okay. Another reason is if the patient had some kind of, you know, lumbar puncture, you know, because those are considered procedures also. So they might bleed. 
All right. Another contraindication is if the patient has known, uh, you know, blood disorders like hemophilia. Right. Obviously, you cannot give TPA because they're going to bleed. All right. And then another is you have to do a, a CBC because you want to check if there is, uh, you know, low platelet count. If there is, uh, you know, uh, thrombocytopenia or low platelet count, you cannot give TPA because the patient might bleed. All right. Remember, there's a fine line between uh, thinning the blood and uh, bleeding. Okay. So there are certain every country, every hospital, every state, every territory has its own uh, policies. So you have to follow the policies of wherever you're going to work in. Okay. As a doctor. Okay. All right. So, um, you know, you cannot give, there are certain indica uh, indications and contraindications that you need to identify. Now, another contraindication is if there is rapid improvement. Let's say, for example, you interviewed the wife. The wife said, well, you know, doctor, around 2 o'clock in the morning, he, he, can, he could not get up. He fell to the floor and then he could not get up. And then he could not speak at all. And then now the patient is speaking and it's only one hour. All right. It's only been one hour then no need to give the TPA, okay? Because for all you know, it's just a TIA, right? So if there is rapid improvement, do not give it anymore, okay? So again, you need to follow, identify the contraindications and indications, and then uh, you need to follow the protocols and rules and regulations of every territory or hospital or country where you are working, okay? All right. Now, of course, if you cannot give TPA, it doesn't mean you cannot do anything else for the patient, right? Then you can actually give, okay, antiplatelets like aspirin, clopidogrel, right? And then the dipyridamol, right? Okay, or you may give anticoagulation with heparin or comadine or warfarin, right? Okay, so when, when do you give antiplatelets and when do you give anticoagulant or anticoagulation? All right. Of course, again, it depends on the country, territory, hospital, whatever. But generally, please listen. Generally, if the problem is the heart, like atrial fibrillation, okay, mitral valve prolapse, or there is uh, vegetation in the heart, there is cardioembolism, if it's the heart that is the cause of the stroke, then generally you give anticoagulants. Okay? You start with heparin and then eventually comodin or warfarin. Heparin is, is liquid, right? So you have to give it IV or you may give it injection, the low molecular weight heparin. Okay, and then you follow what blood test are you going to order if you are using heparin? APTT. Yes, very good. APTT, right? Partial thromboplastin time. That's the one that you need to measure and see if you have enough dose of heparin already. Okay. And then eventually, you will switch the patient to the pills or the oral part or oral form, which is comodine warfarin. You cannot send the patient home on IV, right? So it has to be oral pills. So you will have to switch the patient to comodine or warfarin. And this time, what blood test do you need to order if it's comodine or warfarin? PTT. No, PTT is for heparin. APTT. No, APTT is also for heparin. That's activated partial thromboplastin time. PT, not PTT, but PT, pro time or pro thrombin time. Okay, don't get confused. Okay, PTT is partial thromboplastin time. That's for heparin. All right? When it comes to comadine or warfarin, you're going to measure the PT or pro thrombin time or pro time. Okay, that's not partial thromboplastin time. PTT versus PT. Now, actually, PT or INR, International Normalized Ratio, all right, which means that it's a measure of how thin the blood is, all right? You don't want to go beyond that because the patient will bleed. You're trying to thin the blood because it's too thick. You want to, you know, your blood is too thick. It's flowing too slow. You need to thin it, but you don't want to over thin the blood, okay? So you need to do these blood tests because that will be your guide. Okay, in thinning your blood. Again, generally, if it is uh, cardiac in etiology, then you want to give anticoagulation. Now, there are certain doctors that don't like to give it if the patient is too old already. For example, you know, if the patient is too old, you don't want to anticoagulate with comadine warfarin because they will tend to fall, bump their head, 
they will sustain tabdul hematoma, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, you know, again, it depends on the whatever policies you're gonna have in your territory. Okay, all right. Um, and of course, you need to do blood tests, right? You need to investigate. If this patient had a stroke, then you need to do a brain scan. Initially, you do a CT scan because you want to rule out if it's hemorrhagic versus ischemic. All right? If it's uh, ischemic, okay, then you can go ahead and start the patient on either antiplatelet or TPA or anticoagulation. Okay? All right. And then you need to uh, order other blood tests like cholesterol level. You want to check the, uh, you know, check the patient for blood sugar, hemoglobin A1C for diabetes, right? And then cholesterol and then check the blood pressure. And uh, by the way, if it's ischemic infarct, you don't aggressively lower the blood pressure. Please take note, okay? Everybody will laugh at you if you do this, if you become an ER doctor, okay? If it's ischemic infarct, do not aggressively treat the blood pressure. You want it a little bit, a little bit higher. So it's all like of maybe 130, 140, 150, up to 160. That's still acceptable. But if it's hemorrhagic infarct, meaning there's blood, there's hemorrhage, then by all means, you need to normalize the blood pressure. Okay? Because if you don't, the bleeding will continue and the patient will die and herniate. Okay, again, there are two kinds of infarct. One is ischemic, the other one is hemorrhagic. If it's ischemic, do not be too aggressive when you treat the blood pressure. It's okay for the blood pressure to be high in the first 48 hours. And after that, then you start lowering to normal. Okay, but if it's hemorrhagic, there's blood, by all means, lower the blood pressure to normal. Okay, that's one thing you should learn. And then, of course, you need to order carotid, uh, carotid ultrasound or carotid doctor to check if there's any narrowing or stenosis of the carotid artery. Because remember, middle cerebral artery and anterior cerebral artery are branches of the carotid, right? It is anterior circulation. But if it's posterior, okay, of course you're not going to order carotid. Because posterior is vertebral basilar, not the carotid, right? Okay, so you may do an MRI once the patient is admitted. Okay, now, if the CT scan is already very obvious, there is an infarct of the, let's say, middle cerebral artery, then there's no need to do an MRI. What is that for, right? You already confirmed it. But if it's, uh, you know, if there's a concern, the patient is uh, a little drowsy or the patient uh, or the CT scan is normal because sometimes CT scan does not pick up an infarct, okay? Unlike an MRI because it's soft tissue, the parenchyma of the brain. So MRI is more definitive then you may do an MRI, okay? Uh, and then, of course, you if you think is, this is cardioembolic, the heart is involved, then you may do a two-day echocardiogram, right? To check the movement of the heart walls, all right? See if there's any atrial fibrillation, whatever. You need to do ECG or EKG, right? And then you need to uh, order physical therapy, okay? Occupational therapy. And if the speech is affected, you need to order speech therapy. Okay, now uh, a lot of times patients with stroke are put on NPO, nothing per ORM, until they are evaluated by the uh, speech therapist and they will identify whether it's okay to feed the patient or if it's okay for the patient to eat because swallowing a lot of times is affected in stroke. Okay, and then when do you start physical therapy? They say, uh, you know, some doctors order physical therapy later on. No, oh, you should order physical therapy from the very beginning. Okay? Because you're not going to do an extensive uh, physical therapy anyway. You know, the patient is paralyzed. Let's say paralyzed, right? You, you do not expect the patient to do exhaustive physical therapy. The thera therapist can do what we call bedside passive exercises. Okay? A little extension, flexion of the leg to prevent vein thrombosis, right? And the way you, the, way, the reason why you do that early interventional physical therapy is because you want to prevent uh, spasms or, or spasticity of the extremities. Remember, they will eventually uh, develop spasticity, right? Spastic muscle tone. But you wanna be, you wanna uh, slow it down, okay? And then, uh, what else do you need to do? Uh, that's it, okay? So again, uh, ideally, you wanna give TPA because it will, it will dissolve the blood clot. But if you don't know the time and there are no uh, you know, indications or there are so many contraindications, then you cannot give PPA. You have to settle with 
uh, uh, antiplatelet or anticoagulant. Okay? And generally, if it's the heart, then you give anticoagulant, heparin and comadine or warfarin. Okay? Otherwise, you can just do antiplatelet. Aspirin is so cheap, right? Once a day, right? So, uh, but you have to be, you inform the patient that the aspirin should be taken with food. Otherwise, okay, they will cause gastric ulcer or peptic ulcer. Okay, all right. I think that's it. Okay, this is an example of multiple infarcts, which may eventually cause vascular dementia, right? You have an infarct here, lacunar infarct, lacunar infarct. This is a lacunar infarct in the posterior limb of the internal capsule, right? This is the anterior limb. This is the posterior limb. And posterior limb will affect the motor fiber. So the patient will have hemiparesis or hemiplegia. Okay? Okay, you already know atherosclerosis. This is a severely atherosclerotic artery. Look, the cavity or the lumen is reduced to a much smaller size, and yet the wall is too thick because of atheroma with calcification. By the way, uh, vasculitis is inflammation of the blood vessels. Therefore, they will assume a rosary bleeding, right? Do you remember that? Rosary beads, alternating dilatation, Constriction, dilatation, constriction, dilation, constriction, dilation, constriction, right? This can cause uh, stroke. Giant cell arteritis is a form of stroke, right? Polyarteritis nodosa. Moya Moya disease, if you recall your hematology module or cardiovascular module in second year. Venous sinus thrombosis, even the veins can get plugged and therefore they may cause venous infarcts, right? The superior sagittal sinus, the inferior sagittal sinus, the straight sinus, the transverse sinus, sigmoid sinus. See, look here. You don't see a counterpart, the transverse sinus on the one the other side, right? Only here. That means it's blocked. The, uh, the, the contrast media cannot pass through, okay? And you see a cortical infarct, okay? Here, can see that the infarcts are parasagittal, close to the midline. Why? Because it is the superior sagittal sinus that is blocked. Okay, here is the empty delta sign, venous sinus thrombosis. Okay, this one I already discussed, ECG, CT scan, MRI. All right, doctor ultrasound, echocardiogram. Okay, primary prevention is very important. Remember, prevention is always better than cure, right? Okay, so as early, you know, even though the patient hasn't had a stroke, warn them about their diet. It has to be low salt, low fat diet, a lot of fiber. Okay, if they have obstructive sleep apnea, tell them to uh, refer them to the ENT doctor so they can have a, uh, you know, uh, surgery on their airway, or they may have the CPAP machine while they sleep, weight reduction for overweight patients, okay, cholesterol medications, blood pressure control, diabetes control, antiplatelets, all right, anticoagulants, if it's really the heart, okay, anticoagulation, This is, these are surgical procedures, right? If you have severe stenosis, then you may do certain procedures. You insert this and then the balloon, and then you inflate the balloon to push out the arteroma, right? To uh, open up the lumen or the cavity of the stenotic blood vessel. Okay, you may do carotid endarterectomy. You remove the clot, the plaque. Okay, and then you insert a screen, stent. See, you remove the plaque and then you put, put a shunt to bypass the uh, blockage. Some strokes, if they affect the cortex, they, they may get seizures, patients may get seizures. So you treat the seizure. Maybe you put them on a seizure medicine for about three months only and eventually stop it. Hemorrhage, again, if it's hemorrhagic infarct, you can be aggressive in terms of the blood pressure because it will accumulate, right? And, uh, you know, 
um, one, how will you determine, without the CT scan, how will you determine whether it's ischemic in part versus hemorrhagic in part? If there is rapid progression, like, like rapid, okay, within an hour, within two hours, most likely that's hemorrhagic, okay? Again, like I said, for example, the first time the patient came in, the patient only had paralysis on the right side. And then later on, after two hours, the patient cannot speak anymore. Okay, so it could be, there are two possibilities. It could be hemorrhagic versus stroke in evolution. Okay, so you need to do a brain scan. And if you're just trying to rule out hemorrhage, of course, CT scan is good. You already discussed aneurysm and hypertensive hemorrhage. Okay, this is hemorrhage. Okay, blood. This is hemorrhage of the lenticular straight arteries. This is hemorrhage of the lenticular straight arteries, ruptured arteries, and then it's spilled into the ventricle. So there's intraventricular hemorrhage already. Okay, now subdural epidural hematoma can also be considered intracranial hemorrhage, right? Okay, you already know what to do for those. Okay, this is uh, hemorrhage secondary to basal ganglia hemorrhage secondary to uh, rupture of the lenticular straight branches of the middle cerebral artery. By the way, when it comes to cerebellum, cerebellum, the posterior fossa is a very tight space. All right, so if you have an infarct or hemorrhage of the cerebellum, okay, definitely it will cause herniation fast. So what they do, what surgeons do is they actually, a lot of times they do what we call cerebellectomy. They remove the cerebellum, okay? It can be compatible with life. The patient can still survive, but because there's no more cerebellum, then they will have ataxia forever, all right? They will not be able to maintain correct posture anymore, right? But at least the patient's life is saved. Sometimes you have to weigh the benefits and the risks. Which one is better for this patient? But if this patient is already 95 years old, with multiple medical problems, sedentary anyway, then there's no need to do surgery, okay? You are going to cause death by doing that. Okay, that's it. All right, do you have any questions? No more. Okay, it's uh, 12 something, I think. Okay, good luck on your exam. Uh, let me just tell you uh, a few things. Okay, hold on before you... Let me just tell you a few things, uh, uh, things that you need to concentrate on. Um, All right, please study the, uh, you know, I told you the neurons, parts of the neuron, uh, remember dendrites, axon, uh, and also the different types of neuron and the different glial cells, right? The astrocytes, microglia, oligodendrocytes, one cells. Okay, please study that. And then please study the cer uh, cerebral cortex, right? Remember the primary motor, primary sensory, the leg part is in the median surface, right? And then the face, the head, the hand are big. They have big representation in the cortex. You need to know those, okay? And then the visual pathway, right? Remember the pathway from the uh, retina to the optic nerve and then optic chiasm and then optic tract and then lateral geniculate body of the thalamus and then the visual radiations, okay? At least you should know that. And then uh, the, remember I told you the extraocular muscles, okay? All you need to do is remember that one particular drawing to determine which ones will elevate the eyeball, which ones will depress the eyeball, which one will rotate the eyeball inward, et cetera, et cetera. And then you need to... Uh, 
uh, again, the cerebral cortex localization, right? The angular gyrus, the um, procus area, okay? The Wernicke's area, the primary auditory cortex, what will happen if you have a damage there, if you get a tumor there, if you get a stroke there, right? Cerebellum, remember, cerebellum is uh, ipsilateral, and then, uh, you know, what will happen? Dysmetria, this the other, this the other cochinitia, right? And then the in terms of the spinal cord, know the tracts where are they located, right? Dorsal column, the lateral cortical spinal tract, the lateral spinothalamic tract, and remember the arteries, the anterior spinal artery, posterior spinal arteries. Okay, you need to know those. And then remember the pupils, right? The Horner syndrome. Horner syndrome is meiosis, incomplete ptosis, and anhydrosis. Okay. What is the reason for those, okay? And then how will you determine whether the facial paralysis is central or peripheral? Is it just Bell's palsy or is it uh, um, stroke or brain tumor in the brain, okay? All right, and then of course, the uh, neuro exam. Remember, you need to do the, the, you know, the different maneuvers. And of course, uh, the uh, Rene testing, the... Uh, um, Weber testing, right? The muscle tone, <clears throat> the um, the grades of muscle strength, right? Zero to five, the reflex, zero to four. Okay, and then the mental status exam. Remember the uh, judgment, insight, um, the abstract thinking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then how will you, you know, remember the examination of the visual um, or visual examination of thalmoscopy, the optic disc, Okay, and then the uh, the different types of headaches. Remember the more common ones, right? Migraine, cluster, tension. Okay, and then uh, giant cell arteritis. All right, and then pseudotumor cerebri. Okay, and then uh, in terms of infections, you need to know, um, you know, uh, the, the more common ones, the meningococcal meningitis. Okay, the um, uh, herpes simplex virus encephalitis, right? And then the, uh, you know, TB meningitis, neurosyphilis, okay? And then no uh, febrile seizures, right? And then uh, the difference between uh, pseudo seizures and epileptic seizures. And then, um, uh, you know, the, the, the different types of seizures. And then EEG, for example, you know, if I show you a tracing of EEG, you should know whether it's generalized or partial or is it absence or is it a uh, simple, comp simple uh, partial seizure? Is it complex partial seizure? Okay. And then, uh, and, you know, multiple sclerosis. If, you know, how will you treat a patient? Are you going to give steroids? Or are you going to give the disease-modifying treatments like uh, interferons? Remember, I don't have to know the specific drugs. Okay. But at least, you should know what to do okay, in the acute phase, um, you know, to prevent relapse, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then I think that's it, right? And then the discussion today, you know, at least you should know the differences between the different types of dementia, okay? The preferential atrophy, posterior, anterior, and then what's the main one is with vivid hallucinations, the different triads, the, um, uh, what else? The um, Parkinson's, very easy, right? How will you treat Parkinson's? What are the symptoms? Okay, and then um, Wilson's disease, right? Wilson's, copper metabolism, okay? Kaiser fleischer ring, okay? And then Huntington's disease, you have a triad of, uh, you know, psychiatric, dementia, and Korea, okay? The trinucleotide repeat, right? And then... Um, what else? Tourette syndrome, right? The vocal tics, motor tics. Um, difference between atitosis and dystonia. Dystonia is the posture is uh, sustained. All right. And then um, what else? The stroke, uh, you know, all those things that I mentioned. Okay. You don't even have to go to the specifics. But if you know, the cerebral cortex, then you know what, what symptoms the patient will show, right? Okay, hemiparesis, hemisensory loss, why coma, all right, why uh, dizziness, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, all right, that's it. Good luck on your studies and uh, I will see you when I see you. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Doc, how many questions?
uh, 40. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you.